Okay, so welcome everyone to the 71st lecture of Dr. Hailey Step 1 and the second lecture of Microbiology for USMLE Step 1 from First State 2020. Hope you guys are all doing well. Uh, thank you so much for making it to, to today's lecture. Uh, if First and foremost, if you guys can hear my voice, can I get a yes on the chat box, please? Okay, so thank you so much for making it to today's lecture. Uh, and um, uh, before we begin the lecture, uh, let's welcome a couple of our new students who have joined our lecture. And uh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, Dr. Hadri, step one is a text by text breakdown of First State 2020. And um, we associate high yield U world questions and U world notes. But uh, unfortunately, I'm not sure how much of that we would be doing this week. <clears throat> But after the end of our lectures, our lectures are usually divided into three or four segments where we do first aid, then we do U world questions, then we do U world notes, all of which we will be doing in the future. But this week we are focused on finishing microbiology solely. And um, that's that. Do you guys have any questions regarding our previous lectures or how you can recover? Does anyone have any question, especially to the new students? Especially the new students, do you guys have any questions? one of our team members let us know that uh, there might be some questions from the new students. So uh, if you guys have any uh, have any questions, please let me know, I'll, I'll answer them for you. No problem, okay. So uh, before we begin today's lecture, <clears throat> our goal for yesterday was to read uh, pages 124 to pages 140. And today our goal is to read, uh, and, and, and we finished up to page 135 instead of 140 yesterday knowing that uh, it, would pre it would put a lot of pressure on a lot of students. So uh, today our goal is to go from one page 135, that is clinical bacteriology, all the way to page 140, I mean 135 to page 145, and hopefully finishing the entire clinical bacteriology as much as possible. That includes all the gram positives and all the gram negatives. That's what we're going to do. But before we do so, I want to make sure really quick, if you guys did your homework, which we talked about yesterday, did everyone do their homework? Did everyone do their homework? Our homeworks were to learn and memorize all the high yield things, which I asked you guys to learn and memorize, instead of doing you world questions. Can I get some feedback from all the students, please? Uh, did, were you guys able to complete your homeworks? All the students, were you guys able to complete your homeworks? That includes Dr. Yosef, Dr. Evelyn, Dr. Hossam, Dr. Jan, Dr. Jordan, Dr. Kameshwari, Dr. Nikki, Dr. Ahmed, Dr. Karbasi, Dr. Khatun said yes. Okay, that's good. Dr. Priyanka said yes. That's very good. Okay, everyone else? Okay, so considering if you guys uh, did your homework, can we do can we do a small segment where I ask you questions and let me test you guys out? Yes or no? Can I test you guys out? Is everyone ready for the test to see whether we have done the homework or not done the homework? Everyone? Shall we begin our um, revision and recapitulation segment? Is everyone ready? I need some feedback from you guys in the chat box. If you guys are ready, please say yes so that I can begin and we can move forward.
Okay, so let's begin with the questions and answers. Are you allowed to? Are you guys allowed to look at the book when you guys answer the questions? <clears throat> are you guys allowed to look at the book when you guys are answering the question? I need some fast answers, please. No. Okay. So if you guys still look at the book, am I still going to know? Am I so going to have any idea if you guys are still looking at the book? No. Okay. So is it possible for you guys to stay true and honest to yourself and not look at the book and give me the proper answer? Because if the only person you would be deceiving is yourself, to be honest. Okay. So please um, do not look at the book and let's start with the revision. First of all, I want to make sure that we are all good with the structures of uh, the bacteria. Okay. Now, um, which one is a glycoprotein structure, fl flagellum or a pilus? Fast answers, please. Flagellum or a pilus, which one is a glycoprotein structure? Very good. It's a pilus. Okay. What are the, what are the, the structures or substances that is present in the bacterial spore? DNA, keratin-like coat, then DP colonic acid, keratin-like coat, DNA, DP colonic acid, and which one? And another one, the sugar backbone, sugar backbone, peptidoglycan, very good, okay, okay. Staphylococcus epidermidis has a layer which helps it adheres to the uh, to the indwelling catheters. What is the name of that layer? Slime layer or biofilm? Okay, okay. Which types of bacteria have a periplasmic space? Which types of bacteria have a periplasmic space? Gram negative. Okay. Now, um, cytoplasmic membrane. Cytoplasmic membrane um, <clears throat> is uh, we know that one we know that one uh, type of bacteria have a lipotechoic acid, which is responsible for causing um, which is responsible for sepsis. Another one is could you guys would you guys be able to tell me what are the two cytokines that lipotechoic acid um, in um, lipotechoic acid they stimulate IL-6 is not the one so IL-1 and tumor necrosis factor very good okay now which bacteria they have no cell wall which bacteria lack cell wall chlamydia mycobacteria is the wrong answer it's mycoplasma Uroplasma, anaplasma, okay, Ehrlichia. Did anyone mention Rickettsia? Legionella is the wrong answer. Legionella is not the right answer. Chlamydia is the one, okay. So if I go from the cell wall, C-E-L-L-W-A-L-L, -L -L, it's Chlamydia, Ehrlichia, then the L, we made it into an A, so it's anaplasma. W is an inverted M, that's mycoplasma, U for uroplasma, and another L was for rickettsia. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> which organisms are, uh, which organisms cannot be gram stained properly? Fast chances, please. Which organisms cannot be gram stained? Rickettsia, chlamydia, wisteria, then plasmodium is not the right answer. Trypanosome is the right answer. <clears throat> Mycoplasma, mycobacteria. Okay. First and foremost, who is confident to um, name the mnemonic which we learned for this? Who is confident to name the mnemonic? Who 
who is confident to name the mnemonic which we learned for this. These little microbes may unfortunately lack real color, but are everywhere. Okay, but are everywhere. So with that, we have we have trypanosome, leptospira, mycobacteria, mycoplasma, uroplasma, legionella rickettsia, chlamydia, bartonella, anaplasma, and ehrlichia. Okay. Okay. Um, now this question goes out to one student. Okay, to see if they have learned or not. First and foremost, this question goes out to, I'll start from number one. The question goes out to Dr. Abed Sheikh Yosef. Would you be kind enough to tell me only, if you want to unmute yourself or use the chat box, it, it's up to you. Um, which organisms will stain with Jimsa stain? Which organisms will stain with the Jimsa stain? Dr. Abed Sheikh Yosef. Very good. Rickettsia, then chlamydia. Very good. Next one, trypanosomes. Then plasmodium, plant. I suppose you mean plasmodium. Okay, next one is Borrelia and Helicobacter. Borrelia and Helicobacter. Okay, next one is Dr. Adenom. Would you be kind enough to, to, to let me know which organisms will stain with silver stain? Which organisms will stain with silver stain? If you can unmute yourself, that's okay. If not, use the chat box. Silver stain. Do you guys remember CPHL? Over there, I mentioned one fungi, which is very, very important. That is coccidiotis, very good. Coccidiotis imitis. Okay. Then, Legionella, coccidiotis, pneumocystis, and helicobacter. Okay, pneumocystis and helicobacter. Okay. Which organism will stain with periodic acid stain? Uh, with periodic acid shift stain for everyone. The question goes out for everyone. Periodic acid shift stain. Okay. Which organism will grow in Tyre Martin agar media? Okay. Which organism will grow in Regan low medium? Regan low. Very good. Bordadella. Okay. Which organism will grow in Lowenstein Jensen agar? Okay. Which organism will grow in charcoal yeast agar with cysteine and iron? <clears throat> Okay, which organism will grow in Eaton's agar? Eaton's. Very good. Which organism will grow in Sobiroid agar? Okay, which organism will grow in Eucene methylene blue, EMB? Okay. Which organisms are exclusively Arabic? Exclusively Arabic organism. Nagging pests must breed. Okay. Okay. Which, are, which organisms are exclusively an Arabic? And this question goes out to Dr. Um, Allison. Dr. Allison, would you be kind enough to answer which question, uh, which Bacteria are exclusively an Arabic. You can use your chat box to provide the answer, no problem. Can't. Then mnemonic is can't breathe fresh air. Okay. Okay. It's clostridium, very good. Then can't breathe fresh air. C for clostridium, then B for bacteroids. Fusobacterium, very good, and A4. 
actinomyces very good okay very good next one is would you guys be able to tell me which uh, bacteria are obligate intracellular obligatively intracellular organisms stay inside when it is really chilly and cold rickettsia coxiella and chlamydia okay and chlamydia okay now which uh, or, uh next question goes out to dr evelyn dr evelyn would you be kind enough to answer only which organisms are purely urease positive urease positive you can use your chat box or use um the mic, whichever you prefer. Which organisms are urease positive? Okay, you weren't at class yesterday. Okay, no problem. So uh, please go through the lecture which we did from yesterday. We did. We asked everyone to do a lot of homeworks. Okay, so make sure that you complete them so that uh, you don't st stay behind. Okay, no problem. The question goes to Dr. Hossam. Which organisms are urease positive? Only P chunks, very good. Okay, so with P chunks, what are the organisms? Protease, C4, Cryptococcus, H4, H4, Helicobacter, Right, okay, Helicobacter, then U4, Uroplasma, N4, <clears throat> N4 Nocardia, K4, Klebsiella, very good, okay, K4 Klebsiella, S, S, very good. S, S is for Staphylococcus, Saprophyticus, and Epidermidus. Okay, good. Okay, good, okay. Now, next one is you have an organism which produces sulfur granule pigments. What organism am I talking about? Very good, Actinomyces. You have an organism which produces green pigments. Which organism am I talking about? Pyocyanin and pyoverdin, very good. You have an organism which produces golden yellow pigments. Which, which organism am I talking about? <clears throat> Staph aureus. You have an organism which produces red pigments. Which organism am I talking about? Okay. What is the method of killing spores? What is the method of, kill, of, of killing spores? Out of way. Okay. Okay, next one is which organisms use protein A as a virulence factor? Which organisms use IgA protease? Okay, which organisms use M protein? Okay, now, uh, which organisms? Okay, next one. Next one is, there is a method of bacterial uh, reproduction and antibiotic resistance where competent bacteria, they take up naked DNA from the environment. Which, uh, which process is this? Transformation. Next one is, there is a, next one is, there is a method of antibiotic resistance where they, where they, they use um, pilus to true transmit plasmids, to transmit plasmids, conjugation, okay. Another one is, what is the name of the process where the plasmid gets incorporated in the chromosomal DNA? High frequency recombination, okay. What is the method of um, lytic bacteriophage? Lytic bacteriophage transporting DNA from one is general, uh, generalized transduction. Okay. What is the mechanism where the lysogenic bacteriophage 
incorporates its, its own DNA in the bacterial DNA, and then it's specialized strands. Good. Now, next one is you have a segment in um, your plasmid, which is a specialized segment of DNA. And um, they use this uh, specialized segment <clears throat> to regain antibiotic resistance. This is transposition. Okay. Good. Which types of uh, organisms, gram positives or gram negative, use endotoxin? Okay, gram negative. Now, let's talk about the exotoxins. Okay. What is the name of the exotoxins which, which inactivates elongation factor 2? Two exotoxins. Exotoxin A by Pseudomonas and diphtheria toxin. Okay. Now, which two organisms will inactivate 60A's, 60S ribosome by removing adenine from ribosomal RNA? Shigella and Shigella-like toxin. Okay. Which four organisms cause their activities by abnormal CAMP level? Vibrio, ETEC, EBV, very good. With that, we have Bacillus anthrax, Bacillus anthracis, ETEC, Vibrio colony. Another one is Bordadella, Bordadella pertussis. Okay. Um, enterotoxigenic E. coli, how many types of toxin do they produce? Two. Which one acts on AMP and which one acts on GMP? Labile is AMP and stable is GMP. Okay. If labile, if you activate AMP, which types of uh, ions or salt or compounds would you be hampering? Chloride. How about GMP? Sodium chloride. Okay. Next one. Next one is um, which two organisms cleave snares and hamper with neurotransmitter transportation? Okay, good. Which organism uses alpha toxin to degrade tissues and cell membranes? Perfringes. Okay. So, uh, do we have any exotoxin which can cause uh, septic shock or sepsis? Okay. What are the names of those exotoxins which can cause septic shock? They act as super antigens, very good. That is TSST, that is toxic shock syndrome toxin and, and what is the toxin released from, from streptococcus erythrogenic exotoxin A? Okay. Erythrogenic exotoxin, okay. Can anyone tell me what mechanism do they use? Do they use cross-linking of beta region of TCR, or do they activate by, act, by acting as a super antigen? Okay, cross-link. Okay, what are the three components of the immune system Yes, the answer is both, by the way. So the answer is both. Cro they cross-link and act as a super antigen. Okay. What are the three components of the immune system which endotoxin activates? Complement, macrophage, and tissue factor. Okay. If you activate the comp uh, if you activate the macrophage, what are the substances that are released from macrophage activation? Okay, if you activate the complements, what are the substances released from complement activation?
And if you activate the tissue factor, what are the substances that, what is activated with the tissue factor? What happens? DIC. Okay, so that's that. <clears throat> now, did you guys study about the breakdown of the gram positive bacteria according to their structures and catalase? Okay, so before we begin today's lecture, okay, let me ask you guys uh, optogen sensitivity, optogen sensitivity. Which organisms are sensitive to optogen? And which one is resistance? Okay, so strep pneumonia <clears throat> overpass, that is viridens is resistance and pneumonia is sensitive, very good. What about bacitracin sensitivity? Bacitracin sensitivity. Group B is resistant, group A is sensitive, okay. Then what about, um, what about novobiosin sensitivity? Saprophyticus is resistance and epidermidis is sensitive. Okay, good, very good. Right. So with that being said, are we ready to begin with, um, <clears throat> with, with uh, uh, today's topic? <clears throat> okay, good. So let's begin with today's topic. We are going to jump into our first bacteria. Uh, this is a very easy and a very high yield bacteria to understand. That is Staphylococcus aureus. Staphylococcus aureus is a gram positive. Okay, it's a gram positive beta hemolytic. Okay, so b b before we begin, I will talk about the bacteria as a whole. I will talk about the questions that will come from Staphylococcus. And for the harder bacteria, for the harder ones only, for example, we might come across some bacteria uh, which will be a bit difficult for us to remember. For example, we have bacteria such as Listeria, then we have bacteria such as Actinomyces. For some of the bacteria we will read, uh, we will have the uh, picture mnemonics from physio, but for most of the bacteria we'll learn from first aid by itself, okay, because it's really easy to understand. Now, Let's begin with the first bacteria that is Staphylococcus aureus. It's a gram positive, beta hemolytic, catalase positive, and coagulase positive. Do you guys remember yesterday what we talked about? That first of all, the, the first thing we do is we do a gram positive test. After we do a gram positive test, if it's purple, it's positive, then you see the shape. If it's a cocci, the next thing which you do is, what is the next thing you do if it's a cocci? Fast answers, please. If you see it's a bacilli, you do Arabic and anaerobic. If it's a branching filament, you do Arabic and anaerobic. If it's a cocci, what the next thing you do is catalase test. If it's a positive one, very good. Thank you, Dr. Uday, Dr. Hassan, Dr. Dahlia. If you do a positive test, then it's a staphylococcus. If it's staphylococcus, then the next test, which one do you do? After you see that it's catalase positive, fast answers, please, coagulase test. If you see it's coagulase positive, then the organism is staph for you. So if they mention if it, that there is an organism which is gram positive, catalyst positive, coagulase positive, which organism are they talking about? Fast answers, please. Which, are, which organism are they talking about? Staph for you. okay. So that's how they will describe the organism. Okay, gram positive, beta hemolytic, catalyst positive, coagulase positive, that's that. Protein A will bind to the FC region of immunoglobulin G and inhibit the complement activation and phagocytosis. We know that this is the virulence factor. We talked about this yesterday. That is, the protein A will prevent phagocytosis. This is extremely high yield. Okay. Okay. Uh, by the way, uh, every day, do we have to read the microbiology during the lecture or do we tell you exactly what to read and instead of doing you world questions, you read it at home? Fast answers, please. 
Okay, class dances at home. Okay, good. So do we do your all questions for the next five days from microbiology? No, good, very good, okay. So the protein A will bind to the FC region of immunoglobulin G, inhibit the complement activation and phagocytosis. And where do we usually find the most common location that the questions will usually come is from the colonization of the anterior nares, okay? From the anterior nares, meaning the nose, the anterior portion. And then you have ears, axilla, and groin because uh, always remember wherever there is a hair follicle, wherever there is hair follicle, okay? There is a chance of growth of Staphylococcus aureus, okay? Hair, hair, hair follicles, they love to colonize at the follicles, but especially their common location is the nares. The diseases that they will cause are inflammatory and toxin mediated. Inflammatory diseases are very easy to understand. That is, they can cause skin infections such as uh, abscess boil, folliculitis, and all of those things. So skin infections, abscess, they can even colonize in the lungs and cause lower pneumonia, right? And always remember that after, often after influenza viral infection, there will be multiple questions in the step one where they will tell you that you have, a, you have had a patient, you have had a patient who previously got uh, infected with uh, influenza virus, and now the patient has uh, crackles, fever, and uh, on x-ray, one lobe is OPAC, okay? which organism is most likely to cause secondary infection? Always remember, if it's an influenza virus, the secondary infection is by, secondary infection is by Staph aureus, okay? Staph aureus, always remember this. This is a very high yield, you world question, okay? Next one. Next one is endocarditis. Even for endocarditis, especially for uh, IV drug users, the tricuspid endocarditis or tricuspid valve regurgitations that usually happens in a patient or uh, tricuspid stenosis, whichever, but the right side of the heart is more affected because the patients, they uh, inject the, eye, the drug in the vein and the organisms they usually colonize on the skin and so they can gain entry into the blood and go straight to the right side of the heart and colonize on the tricuspid valve. So endocarditis is number one, <clears throat> and then you have the rest. Then they can also cause septic arthritis and osteomyelitis. We know that. Then the next one is toxin-mediated disease. Toxin-mediated disease, we talked about this, that how staph aureus, they uh, secrete toxic shock syndrome, toxin one, right? Then they, they do, it. What, what do they do? They, what they do is they cross-link the beta region of the MHC on, to on antigen-presenting cells and they cause overactivation by releasing the cytokine. So that's that. Don't forget the mechanism of action of toxic shock syndrome, toxin one, which we discussed in details, which we discussed in details over here, okay? This one, this is extremely high yield. This is the mechanism of toxic shock syndrome, toxin, okay? So that's that. Now, now the next one that we wanna talk about is MARSA, okay? Uh, that is methicillin resistant staph aureus. It's a very important cause of serious nosocomial and community acquired infections. Resistance are due to altered penicillin binding protein. Okay, now over here, first and foremost, can anyone tell me where is the pre where where do the penicillin binding protein subside in a bacterial cellular structure? Where do we find the penicillin binding protein? Cytoplasmic membrane. Cytoplasmic membrane. The students usually make a mistake for which part, which, which part do they think the penicillin binding protein is usually in? I talked about this, then we talked about the mistake too. Students usually make a mistake, very good, cell wall. They usually think it's on the cell wall, it's not, it's on the cytoplasmic membrane. So over there, what happens is you have a penicillin binding protein. So due to altered penicillin binding protein, there is, there is resistance. So if there's alteration of the penicillin binding protein, the penicillin or methicillin, they cannot go and bind to the staph aureus and then they cannot cause their mechanism of action. As a result, this happens due to a MECA gene from staphylococcal chromosome cassette involved in penicillin resistance. So basically you have a gene in the staphylococcus, the name of the gene is MECA. This MECA gene, if this undergoes a mutation, if there's a mutation, then there is alteration of the penicillin binding site. 
from the cytoplasmic membrane. As a result, you cannot have penicillin or methicillin that can go and work and cause their mechanism of action. So we choose, uh, we choose another antibiotic, which I'm not sure if they have mentioned over here, which, an, which antibiotic do we choose in order to treat MRSA, methicillin resistant staph aureus? Everyone should answer this, very good. The antibiotic is vancomycin, okay? The antibiotic which we choose is vancomycin. So write this down over here, if you are not aware of this, that the antibiotic is vancomycin for MRSA, okay? Now, let's talk about toxic shock syndrome toxin. Toxic shock syndrome toxin one is a super antigen that binds to the MHC and TCR, resulting in polyclonal T cell activation and cytokine release, okay? So I need you guys to underline this one, polyclonal not monoclonal. Well, what do we mean by polyclonal T-cell activation? That is multiple types of T-cell. We know that we have CD8, CD4, T-regulatory cells, and we have T -A, uh, then we have T-regs -T and TH17s, right? So all of those cells will get activated at the same time. So this is, this is known as polyclonal T-cell activation, and there will be massive cytokine release. So that, that. Now, what are the clinical features of staphylococcal toxic shock syndrome? First of all, the, pa the patients will have fever along with GI symptoms, but the patients will have rash desquamation. All of those things will be present along with shock, where the features of shock are basically, the patients will have hypotension, tachycardia, right? Hypotension, tachy tachycardia, tachypnea, that's that. And along with this, there will be liver damage. So the patients will have increased AST and ALT. So clinical features are once again, which what? Fever, vomiting, rash, shock, liver failure. Fever, vomiting, rash, shock, liver failure. Okay. With the liver failure or signs of liver damage, there will be increased AST, ALT, and bilirubin will be high. Okay. It is associated with prolonged use of vaginal tampons or nasal packing. And this is one of the most common ways the questions are going to come over here. The questions will tell you that you have a young patient who, uh, who has not changed uh, the tampon she used during her menstruation and it's been there for the last one week. And now the patient presented to your clinic with fever, rash, signs symptoms of, um, signs, signs symptoms of hypotension and when you do a test, you find that there is uh, increased AST and ALT. What type of antigen or, or which are, or, or, or like what's going on over here? Well, well, what's going on is you have a toxic shock syndrome toxin that's going on. And it's a super antigen that is binding to the MHC and T cell resulting in polyclonal T cell activation and cytokine release. So that's that. Now, if you have to compare this with streptococcal pyogenes toxic shock syndrome, okay. Um, it is, um, <clears throat> when we see that, then we can see that in streptococcus pyogenes, toxic shocks, and we'll, we'll talk about the comparison, but when we read streptococcus pyogenes, so we'll leave this behind. Next one. Next one that we will go to is staph aureus food poisoning. Staph aureus food poisoning is due to in ingestion of preformed toxin, okay? Um, first and foremost, um, if we talk about ingestion of preformed toxin, then can we assume that um, this is the food which has been standing idle for a long period of time, at least for more than two to six hours, yes or no? Food which has been standing idle, okay. okay. The most uh, common food that is presented in the step one question is potato salad, okay? Always remember this, potato salad. They talk about potato salad, which is there in a barbecue. Uh, and um, the potato salad has been sitting outside in the sun for a long period of time. And whoever has that salad ends up with uh, nausea, vomiting, non-bloody diarrhea, okay? So non-bloody diarrhea and emesis. And the incubation period is two to six hours. And um, the toxin is enterotoxin, which is a heat stable toxin, not destroyed by cook. That's that, okay? Another one is the uh, enzyme coagulates, okay? I mean, yes, the enzyme coagulates. Do you think it, it helps the staph aureus form a clot around, uh, uh, do you think that it helps the staph aureus form a clot around the, around the fibrin and this allows a proper activation and formation of an abscess? 
Yes, okay. So there is another question over there that which part or which enzyme is required for staph aureus to form a clot and form an abscess. The enzyme that is required is coagulase. So staph aureus makes coagulase. Okay, so as, as you can see from over here, first and foremost, the most important question from all of this one is this one, that is the identification, okay? Identification. If I ask you that you have, uh, you, we have identified a bacteria, which is gram positive, uh, gram positive catalase negative, and it's beta hemolytic, bacitracin sensitive. Which organism am I talking about? Gram positive, catalase negative, beta hemolytic, and bacitracin sensitive. Bacitracin sensitive. Okay, so, very good. It's streptococcus pyogenes. Okay. If I talk about gram-positive bacilli Arabic, which organisms, which three organisms am I talking about? Gram-positive bacilli, which is Arabic, Arabic gram-positive, Listeria, very good, bacilli, bacillus, Listeria, corny bacterium. Okay, good. Okay, good. Next one, next one that we will go to is Staphylococcus epidermidis. Staphylococcus epidermidis, okay. Who can tell me by unmuting themselves what are, what are the properties of Staphylococcus epidermidis? Properties of Staphylococcus epidermidis. Fast answers, please. What are the properties of Staphylococcus epidermidis? How will you describe Staphylococcus epidermidis? Okay, gram positive. Then, after we see gram positivity, what is the next thing we see? Is it a cocci, bacilli, or a branching filament? Gram positive cocci, which is catalase positive, and coagulase negative, and novobiocene. Novobiazine, urease positive, okay, novobiazine sensitive. Okay. So it's a gram positive cocci, catalase positive, coagulase negative, urease positive, cocci in clusters, and novobiazine sensitive. Okay, novobiazine sensitive. So this is how they will, this is how they will identify this one. Normal, they are present in the normal flora of the skin and they can contaminate the blood culture. They do not ferment mannitol. Staph aureus will ferment mannitol, but they will not ferment mannitol. This is, this is actually uh, not that high yield, so don't worry about this. They do not use this one uh, to identify the organism. Next is normal, they, uh, they are present on the normal flora of the skin and they contaminate blood cultures and they inject and they infect prosthetic devices. What do we mean by prosthetic devices? That is, uh, for example, uh, heart valves and hip implants and IV catheters. What they do is they form a biofilm which acts as a slime layer. Slime layers are loose network of polysaccharides. And then they uh, perform their uh, mechanism of action and they cause damage. First and foremost, the question that will come from over here is first, uh, they will tell you exactly the properties of the bacteria after they tell you that you have had a patient with a history of the history of some sort of a prosthetic implantation. History of, history of prosthetic implantation or IV catheters are exclusively high yield for staph epidermidis. Okay, IV catheters are history of prosthetic implantations. So these, these are very important and high yield for staphylococcus epidermidis. Okay, so that's that. Next one is Staphylococcus saprophyticus. Uh, can I, uh, what are the properties of Staphylococcus saprophyticus? Fast answers, please. What are the properties of Staphylococcus saprophyticus? Gram positive, cocci. Okay, this is how you guys will do it. First of all, you will say gram positive or gram negative. Then you will say the shape. Then you will say catalyst positivity. Then you will say coagulase positivity. Then you will say novobiocin sensitivity. Okay, now. Okay, so it's gram positive, catalase positive, coagulase negative, 
coagulase negative, urea is positive, coccine clusters, and novobiocin. What is the novobiocin over here? Novobiocin, fast answers, please. Novobiocin resistant, very good. So Staphylococcus saprophyticus is gram positive, catalase positive, coagulase positive, UEA is positive, cocci and clusters, novobiazine resistant. Okay. It's the normal flora of the female genital tract and perineum. It is the most common cause of uncomplicated UTI in young women. Most common is E. coli. So, first of all, they will tell you that you have a patient who has, who is a young woman with UTI. Okay. The patient, the questions for USMD step one from U World will come from it being that it's a young woman who recently got involved in, uh, who recently was involved in sexual activity and now they have UTI, young women with UTI. This is extremely high yield for, um, this is the type of uh, presentations that they will have for Staphylococcus saprophyticus in the step one, okay? So young women with UTI and for epidermidis, there will be history of prosthetic device implantations and IV catheters. Okay, most commonly these are the types of questions that will be there. And then they will try to uh, describe the organism to you. That is, it's gram positive, catalyst positive, this, that. Which organism are you dealing with? The answers are usually from over here and the questions will usually come from over here. So that's that, okay. Now, if you want to test yourself, which part are you going to cover with your hands? A or B? Which part are you going to cover with your hands for rapid recovery? I mean, rapid revision, not rapid recovery, rapid revision. You will cover A with your hand, you will read this part and then you will see whether you can answer this or not, okay? Always remember, test yourself this way. Cover this part with your hand, read this part and see whether you can name the bacteria, okay? Next one. Next, next one is Streptococcus pneumoniae. Now, Streptococcus pneumoniae, first of all, is it gram positive or gram negative? Fast answers, please. Gram positive or gram negative? Gram positive. Next, is it a cocci, bacilli, or a branching filament? Cocci, bacilli, or a branching filament? It's a cocci. Is it catalyst positive, catalyst negative? It's a catalyst negative. Okay, if it's catalyst negative, then what type of hemolysis uh, is, are, are, are we going to do? The, I mean, there's alpha, beta, and gamma hemolysis. So streptococcus pneumonia is alpha hemolysis. Okay, if it's streptococcus pneumonia is alpha hemolysis. If, we, if it's alpha hemolytic, then what type of bacteria would, I mean, what type of antibiotic would we choose to see whether if it's sensitive or resistant for alpha hemolysis? Optogen, very good. Okay, so if is it optogen sensitive or optogen resistant? So it's optogen sensitive, very good. It's optogen sensitive, okay. Now, Streptococcus pneumoniae is gram-positive, alpha hemolytic, and it's a lancet-shaped diplococci, okay? So always remember that Streptococcus pneumoniae is a lancet-shaped diplococci, meaning that they will stay like this always, okay? In groups of two, mm -hmm. okay? Okay, so it's a lancet-shaped diplococci over here, and it's also catalase-negative, optogen-sensitive, right? and all of those things, so they, that's that. And we also know that they have a virulence factor that is IgA protease and they're optogen opt sensitive and bile soluble. They are, so, they are soluble in the bile. That is actually pretty high yield. A lot of students, they remember all the properties of streptococcus pneumoniae, but they do not remember the properties of bile solubility. Okay, bile soluble, okay. Streptococcus pneumonia will cause pneumonia, obviously, then meningitis, otitis, and sinusitis. We all know that it causes um, these ones. So the easiest way to remember this is MOPS, M-O-P-S, okay? M-O-P-S, just think about a MOP, right? Think about a MOP trying to clean the floor. This MOP has four, so M-O-P-S, M for meningitis, otitis, pneumonia, sinusitis. If you, can, if, if you cannot remember what it causes, it's not high yield, so don't worry about this. The pneumococcus is associated with rusty sputum. Okay, sputum is rusty. 
in pneumonia, sepsis in patients with sickle cell disease and ACE clinic patients. We know that since it, it, it is an encapsulated IgA protease producing organism, it will cause the disease in ACE clinic patient. And if it loses its capsule, then it has no virulence factor. So the capsule is, is the virulence factor. Don't forget this one either. The capsule is important. Okay, the capsule is important. Okay, so that's that. Okay, are we clear about streptococcus pneumonia? Yes or no? Okay, once again, next uh, next one that we're going to discuss is viridens groups of streptococci, viridens streptococci. Viridens streptococci, first and foremost, is it gram positive or gram negative? Is it a cocci, bacilli, or a branching filament? Cocci, if it's a cocci, is it catalyst positive or catalyst negative? Catalyst negative. If it's catalase negative, then it, it will grow on blood agar media and cause, he, or cause hemolysis. If when it causes hemolysis, we see that there's alpha hemolysis. And when we see alpha hemolysis, we do optogen test. Is it optogen sensitive or optogen resistant? Okay, good. So variance groups of streptococci, they are optogen resistant, gram positive, alpha hemolytic optogen resistant and bile insoluble. They're not soluble in the bile. They're normal flora of the oropharynx. And over here, you have streptococcus mutants, and mitis. Okay, mutants and mitis, these are the subgroups of viridin streptococci. Okay, and they are very important for causing dental caries. Okay, over here, sanguines make dextrins that bind to fibrin platelet aggregates on damaged heart valves causing subacute bacterial endocarditis, okay. So over here, over here, what happens is when you have a patient who has, when you have a patient who has dental caries, for example, let's say that this is the patient as you are seeing the patient's teeth from inside the mouth. So let's say that this is, these are the patient's teeth, right? And over here, that's the, that's the, that's the teeth. And you have the dental caries over here over here and over here you have the dental case. So what happens is that with saliva, the organism, it goes through, uh, uh, it goes uh, by, uh, by uh, with the help of the saliva, this, this organism will travel to the lungs. I mean, this will go, my apologies, with uh, the help of the saliva, okay, this organism can actually uh, go and enter. Uh, for example, if there is any, um, bleeding okay if there's any bleeding in your gums this organism with the help of the saliva can enter and when it does enter your uh, blood this organism will travel all the way to the heart and when it travels to the heart it aggregate binds to the fibrin platelet aggregates on damaged heart valves so first and foremost over here the endocarditis that is happening over here is it on a healthy valve or a previously damaged heart valve which one is it causing damage on a healthy one? Okay, disease. So uh, people who have dental caries but who do not have a history of heart valve damage, will they have endocarditis? Okay, so they will not have endocarditis. That's why not everyone has endocarditis. Only the, only the people with previously damaged valve will have damage of endocarditis. If there is a person who has a uh, new onset of endocarditis with uh, marks on her or his hand. Which organism are we thinking about? Staph aureus, very good. We are thinking about Staph aureus, okay. Now, the variance group of streptococci lives in the mouth because they are not afraid of the chin, okay, that's that. Sanguines as blood, think that there's lots of blood in the heart endocarditis, okay? So this is not important. We're not going to use, we are not going to use uh, the mnemonics over here. We will only use uh, our, our knowledge of virulent streptococci, so that's that, okay. Next one is streptococcus pyogenes. Now, streptococcus pyogenes, uh, first and foremost, it is, is it gram positive or gram negative? Fast answers, gram positive. Now, is it a cocci, bacilli, or a branching filament? It's a cocci. If it's a cocci, is it catalyst positive or catalyst negative? Catalyst negative. Then 
which one is this? If it's catalyst negative, then it will grow on blood agar. Is it alpha, beta, or gamma hemolytic? Beta hemolytic. If it's beta, we do bacitrocin test. Is it bacitrocin resistant or bacitrocin sensitive? B breast. Group B resistant, group A sensitive. Group A is sensitive to streptococcus pyogenes is a group A streptococci. That's why, as you can see, that they are growing in chains. It's a gram positive cocci in change that can in change that can cause pyogenic, toxigenic, and immunologic. Immunologic. So they cause a lot of different types of damages. First of all, it's pyogenic, meaning that the they will colonize and cause infection, resulting in pharyngitis, cellulitis, impedigo, erysipelas. Okay. Toxigenic mean that they can cause scarlet, they can cause scarlet fever, toxic shock syndrome, toxic shock-like syndrome, and necrotizing fasciitis. So scarlet fever, toxic shock light syndrome, and necrotizing fasciitis. And immunologic, we all know that they can cause rheumatic fever and glomerular post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. They are bacitrocin sensitive, beta hemolytic. This is this is one thing which we did not discuss, that is pyrodidl, that is pyrolidonal aryl amidis positivity. Pyrolidonal aryl amidis positivity, PYR test. We do a PYR test sometimes to see uh, different types of streptococcus. And over here, streptococcus pyogenes is PYR positive. So that's that. And uh, there are a lot of time when they see, when they try to test you, whether you have intact knowledge of PYR or not. And if, if you can go back to, um, if you can go back to your um, big table over there, you can see that, you can see, for example, if you can go back to this one over here, you can see that they have mentioned PYR status. PYR status is pyogenes is positive and um, agalexia is negative. So the best way to remember PYR status is just remember the sensitivity of bacitrisine. If it's sensitive to bacitrisine, it's PYR positive. If it's not sensitive, it's PYR negative. So the easiest way to remember is this one. That's that, okay, for streptococcus pyogenes. So, and antibodies to M protein, we talked about how M protein is the virulence factor. We know that antibodies, if they're produced against the M protein, they will uh, have molecular mimicry with our own with our own protein structure, and this can mount an immune response. And uh, this can this can give rise to um, rheumatic fever and glomerulonephritis. So what we do is we try to measure, if we suspect that there is a patient with a rheumatic fever, then we try to measure ASO titer, which is antibody to streptolysin O, or anti-DNAs B. These two are high yield. Please underline this one. But that will indicate recent streptococcus pyogenes infection. Okay, so we we measure ASO titer and anti-DNSB. A lot of students, they remember ASO titer very easily, but they have a hard time remembering anti-DNSB antibody. So basically, streptococcus pyogenes is also releasing another anti and another um, substance known as DNAs, which breaks down which breaks down the DNA. Right, and antibody to DNSB is also an indicator of pyogenes infection. Now, let's talk a little bit about scarlet fever. Scarlet fever is uh, the toxigenic infection, which they have mentioned over here. That is, they cause blanching, sandpaper-like body rash, strawberry tongue, sarcom oral pallor, and the setting of group A streptococcal pharyngitis infection. That is, this happens with the help of erythrogenic toxin. If we talk about strawberry tongue in a, young, in, in, a, in a baby, what two diseases are we thinking about? If the baby has strawberry tongue and fever, first and foremost, it's scarlet fever. Another one is, you guys have mentioned, that is Kawasaki's disease, okay? Kawasaki's disease. So these are the two things that we are thinking about. But out of Kawasaki's disease, scarlet fever is more common. So the first thing you will think about is scarlet. If not, you'll think about Kawasaki's disease. Okay, so that's that. Okay. Now, if we are talking about an organism which is gram positive, uh, gram positive, cocci, catalyst positive, coagulase positive, uh, which organism am I talking about? Fast answers, please. Gram positive, cocci, catalyst positive, coagulase positive. Okay, gram positive, uh, gram positive cocci, catalyst positive, coagulase negative, novobiasin sensitive. Novobiasin sensitive. Okay, gram positive, 
cocci, catalase negative, alpha hemolytic, or protein resistant. Virulence, very good. Okay, uh, gram positive, cocci, catalase negative, then it is uh, catalase negative, beta hemolytic, bacitracine sensitive. Now, let's talk about Streptococcus agalexiae. Okay, Streptococcus agalexiae. Uh, first and foremost, is it a gram positive or gram negative? Gram positive, is, is it a cocci, bacilli, or a branching filament? Cocci, catalyst positive or catalyst negative? Catalyst negative. If it's negative, then it will grow on blood agar over there. If, you, if there's alpha, is it alpha, beta, or gamma hemolytic? Beta hemolytic. Okay. If it's beta hemolytic, what type of sensitivity will, test will we do? Bacitracine. Is it bacitracine sensitive or bacitracine resistant? Resistant. So it's a group B streptococci, which is gram positive, bacitracine resistant, beta hemolytic. They will colonize, okay? They will colonize in the vagina and cause pneumonia and meningitis, mainly in babies. So basically, this infection is more common for babies. So women should be screened at 35 to 37 weeks of gestation with rectal and vaginal swab. This is extremely high yield, meaning that just before the baby uh, comes out of the pathway, we have to make sure that the pathway is devoid of streptococcus agalexiae. So dried at 35 to 37 weeks, you have to do a swab to see if there is agalexiae over there or not. If there is agalexiae that is found, the mother can be treated with uh, interpartum penicillin or ampicillin. So we do this as a profile axis to make sure that the baby does not have new onset of neonatal meningitis or pneumonia, okay? This is very widely tested over here in the clinics and hospitals. So this is a very common question. So don't forget this, oh, okay. Next one is Streptococcus agalexiae will produce a CAMP factor. This CAMP factor, do not confuse this with CAMP, this factor is known as CAMP factor, which enlarges the area of hemolysis formed by Staph aureus. So what happens is if you have, uh, we know that Staph aureus is also beta hemolytic. So if you have Staph aureus over here, okay, and if there's an area of, hemo of hemolysis around Staph aureus, when you add Streptococcus agalexiae, this area of hemolysis will increase. This will increase. This is known as CAMP factor. And um, it's also hepurate test positive. There's a, there's a test we do that is HIPRA test. This is not high yield, so don't worry about it. And this is also PYR negative. Okay, what we are going to do is, if you guys can see over here, what we are going to do is we're not going to see the video of Streptococcus uh, agalexiae. What we are going to do is we are going to see the picture mnemonic very quick. Okay. <clears throat> If you guys can see the best, because there's a reason I want you guys to see the picture. I want you guys to remember Streptococcus agalexiae and the CAMP factor, okay? Not the video, only the mnemonic, okay. Okay, as you can see, this picture is a picture mnemonic for Streptococcus agalexiae. Okay, Streptococcus agalexiae, this is a picture mnemonic. Uh, for all the new students, welcome. This is our uh, one resource which we use to solidify the information for drugs and bugs uh, for microbiology and pharmacology. That is, we use Physio and we give out uh, subscriptions for Physio for free. We did that for the last two weeks, uh, but I'm not sure how many days are left in our subscription. But this is the picture mnemonic for Physio, which we use from time to time to learn some, uh, some high yield and uncommon things about some bacteria. Now we are going to use this to learn about Streptococcus agalexiae. First of all, this video over here, as you can see that this uh, glacier, this glacier, okay, this is used to represent Streptococcus agalexiae, okay? Then this is bay for beta hemolytic, this is not high yield. The thing which I want you to focus on is, um, this one is, you can remember that um, this tent over here and this camp, Okay, this camp and this tent is used to remember that that Streptococcus agalexiae is camp factor positive. 
they are CAMP factor positive. And as you can see that they have a pregnant mother over here. And the fact that we should screen the patient at 35 to 37 weeks of gestation is highly important. So this is mentioned by the looking by the look of the pregnant woman with whom we have over here. Another one is um, another one is over here, uh, bacitrisin sensitive. This one, this one, this fire, it it represents camp factor because it it represents um, how that there are tents, right? And then there are sleeping bags, and then you have the fire over here. This fire is help will help you remember that Streptococcus agalexia is camp factor positive. The camp factor positivity once again. It's high yield for you to remember because this is the only organism which will increase the area of beta hemolysis around Staphylococcus aureus. So that's that. Okay, so this is what uh, Streptococcus agalexia is. Okay, next one is Streptococcus bovis. Now, so let's talk a little bit about Streptococcus bovis. Once again, is it gram positive or gram negative? Fast answers, please. Streptococcus bovis, is it gram positive or gram negative? Gram positive, cocci, bacilli, branching filament. What is this? Cocci. Okay, if it's cocci, it's cat is it catalyst positive or catalyst negative? Okay, catalyst negative. Okay, if it's catalyst negative, then it will go on blood agar. Then is it alpha, beta, or gamma hemolytic? Gamma hemolytic. Do you, do you guys remember for gamma hemolysis? What, what, what type of test do we do? Do we do bile, sol bile, bile solubility and PYR test? Yes or no? Very good. 6.5% sodium chloride and bile solubility. Okay. Right? Do we do bile solubility or not? Okay. Always remember that Streptococcus agalexiae, I mean, um, my apologies. Uh, I mean, the st streptococcal organisms that were, that is um, gamma hemolytic will always grow on bile. Okay, they will always grow on bile. So both of them are bile are bile soluble. Okay, so Streptococcus bovis is gram positive. They will colonize the gut, and Streptococcus gallolyticus is the type of Streptococcus bovis, which can cause bacteremia and subacute endocarditis, and is, it is associated with colon cancer. Do you guys remember in one of our U-World notes, we mentioned that if we find Staph aureus, it's IV drug users. If we find weird and Streptococci, it's dental caries. If we find Streptococcus bovis, it's colon cancer. And if we find Vibrio parahemolyticus on, on endocarditis, what uh, disease are we thinking about? Let's see who remembers. Vibrio parahemolyticus. Hemochromatosis. There you go. If, if there is Vibrio parahemolyticus, then it's hemochromatosis. Very good. Okay. Very good, Dr. Hassan. I'm glad you, you remember this. It's from our UO notes. So that's that. Okay. So over here, if you have endocarditis and you culture the organism, the first organism that you find is if it's Staph aureus, you will think about IV drug user. If you find weird and streptococci, you will, you will think about dental caries. Okay. Dental caries. If you find Streptococcus bovis, the next thing is which type of procedure should you do to exclude which other pathology in the patient? Fast answers, please. If you find Streptococcus bovis, which other, what other procedure should you perform? Yes, you should, you should perform colonoscopy. Very good. You should perform colonoscopy to exclude colon cancer. And this is a very high yield question from US Army Step 1 from Streptococcus bovis. Okay, the only question, more or less. Now, next one. Next one is enterococci. Once again, enterococci, gram positive or gram negative? Fast answers, please. It's gram, it's gram positive. Okay, enterococcus is gram positive. Now, uh, is, it, is it a cocci, bacilli? What type of organism is this? It's a cocci, okay. Now, is it um, okay? Is it catalyst positive or catalyst negative? Okay. Then, is it alpha, beta? It's catalyst positive. 
enterococci is it catalyst positive or catalyst negative okay. yes it's negative okay so over here next one is it's gamma hemolytic very good so it's gamma hemolytic if it's gamma hemolytic is it soluble in 6.5 percent sodium chloride no okay so enterococci is a gram positive they are normal uh, colonic flora that are penicillin resistant and cause UTI, biliary tract infections, and subacute endocarditis. Once again, they are catalase negative and PYR positive. Enterococci are most common for causing UTI. Okay, so most of the questions are going to come from a patient who is suffering from UTI. The organism that we have cultured is gram positive, catalase negative, uh, gram positive, cocci, which is catalase negative, and it's PYR positive. PYR positive, and it also it's also gamma hemolytic. Which organism are we talking about? The answer is enterococci. Next one is vancomycin resistant enterococci is another subtype, and this can cause nosocomial infection. Okay, enterococci are more resilient than streptococci, and they can grow in 6.5% sodium chloride and bile test. So that's that. that. Um, over here you have entero for intestine enterococcus fecalis, which is present in the feces. And um, over here, the streptococcus is chain, and um, enterococcus is. Um, wait, what, what, one second. I do, I do, I do, I do not want you guys to use this. Okay, don't use this one. This will get you guys confused. Don't use this one. Okay, just remember PYR positivity. PYR positive. Enterococcus is PYR positive. Okay. They have a lot of questions for the PYR positivity for enterococci. So that's what they will do. Okay, so always remember gram positive, cocci, it is catalyst negative, PYR positive, causing UTI. The first organism they're, ta they're definitely talking about is enterococci. Okay, are we clear about this? Yes or no? Okay, next one. Are we ready to move on to the next one? Okay, let's talk about bacillus anthracis. First of all, is it gram positive or gram negative? Gram positive. If it's gram positive, is it a bacilli cocci or a branching filament? It's a bacilli. If it's a bacilli, do we do catalase test or do we do Arabic or anaerobic test? Arabic or anaerobic test. Is it Arabic or anaerobic bacilli? Is it Arabic or anaerobic? It's Arabic, it's not anaerobic, okay? Anaerobic is Clostridium, right? Propionobacterium, Fusobacterium, it's Arabic. So Bacillus anthrax is a gram-positive spore-forming rod. It forms a spore, okay? It forms a spore and it produces anthrax toxin. Have you guys heard of the disease? Um, have you guys heard of the disease anthrax? Yes or no? Yes, okay. Is it formed from, does that happen from uh, contact with infected, in, in, infected animals? Yes or no? Yes, okay. So Bacillus anthracis is a gram positive spore forming rod that has anthrax toxin. Do you guys remember yesterday we talked about edema factor, which, well, 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 what is the mechanism of action of edema factor? Cam, very good, okay. It, Right, can over there. Okay, so anthrax toxin. It's an exotoxin consisting of protective antigen, lethal factor, and edema factor. And over here, the outer capsule of the of the, of the bacillus anthrax is very high yield, for the fact that they have a polypeptide capsule consists of poly D glutamate. They have a poly D glutamate outer capsule, and this uh, this capsule is a high yield for identification of the bacillus anthracis because not every not every capsule has poly glutamate only bacillus anthracis have poly glutamate so this is highly identified of 
Ambassador Zanzer says, they will colonize, they show a halo of projections, sometimes referred to as Medusa's head appearance. Okay, Ambassador Zanzer says, they show Medusa's head appear. Let me show you over here. Okay, one second. Okay, this is the type of colonization, as you can see, this is the medical, this is the mythical creature that is Medusa with snakes on her head, right? And uh, the, the colonization is usually a bit like this. The reason I'm showing you this one is because this is a high yield question from step one, especially in Amboss, they use this one. So Medusa's head appearance. So uh, Basilis Anthracis, they usually have a Medusa's head appearance on, on the culture. There are two types of anthrax that can happen. First of all, is cutaneous, another one is pulmonary. Cutaneous anthrax is this type of uh, anthrax, as you can see, that it's a painless papule surrounded by vesicles. This is exactly how they will ask you the question that you have a patient who is a farmer. I'll always remember the patient is a farmer who will come with papules surrounded by vesicles and ulcer with a black ash car over here. This one is a that's a black ash car that is painful. That I mean, it's painless and it's necrotic. And it will not produce uh, to it, it will not progress to bacteremia and death. But th this is actually uh, this is actually contaminating. That is, it can actually spread from one person to another. So that's that. Another one is pulmonary anthrax, which is more severe because bacillus anthracis. They're spore forming. If they're spore forming, um, what are the component? What, what, what are the components of the spores? Can anyone tell me really quick? Keratin-like coat, DNA, DP colonic acid, peptidoglycan. Very good. If they are spore forming, they most commonly uh, come from um, inhalation of spores from contaminated animals or animal product, and they can also be used as a potential bioweapon. What does that mean? Bioweapon meaning that we can actually make um, or mass produce. We can actually mass produce the spores and release it on the environment. <laughs> to make sure that they affect people and that can kill people. So that's a potential biological weapon. So that's that. Flu symptoms that progressively progress to fever, pulmonary hemorrhage and mediastinitis. This is high yield. The only way you can identify pulmonary anthrax on a clinical identification is, is if you see a chest x-ray, okay? If you see a chest x-ray over here, you have, um, you have the lungs, right? you have the lungs and then over here you have the cardiac shadow, right? But in a patient with pulmonary anthrax, this cardiac shadow will be increased, okay? This increased cardiac shadow will sh show you that there is widening of the mediastinum. This widened mediastinum like shadow on chest x-ray, this is high yield for pulmonary anthrax. Always remember, if you see an x-ray with widening of the mediastinum like this, Okay, for example, this is the x-ray and the lungs are on this side, okay? And the cardiac shadow is increased over here all the way. This is not cardiomegaly, Bob, uh, by the way. This is over here. If you can see that there's enhancement of the cardiac shadow without any murmur or like anything else, then it's either widening of the mediastinum due to pulmonary anthrax or it could be pericardial effusion, cardiac tamponade, right? Even in some uh, cases of... Um, pericarditis, but if it is associated with a farmer with fever and the widening of mediastinum, the first disease you should, you should think about is pulmonary anthrax. Okay, so that's that. Okay, can you guys just give me one second, please? Give me one second. Okay. So are we clear about this? Yes or no? Okay. 
Okay, good. Next one. Next one that we want to go to is Bacillus series. Okay, Bacillus series. Now, once again, is it gram positive or gram negative? It is gram positive. Okay. Uh, is, is, is it a bacilli cocci or a branching filament? It's a bacilli. Is it Arabic or an Arabic? Last answer, please. Is it Arabic or an Arabic? It's Arabic. We just discussed this. We just discussed that it's Arabic, right? It's Arabic. Okay. Now, Bacillus cereus, it's a gram positive rod. It's, it will cause food poisoning. And like Bacillus anthrax, this Bacillus is also spore forming. And the spores, they survive in the cooking rice. So, what happens is when you have fried rice, for example, the one which we take home by, from uh, Chinese fast foods, and we keep them in the fridge and then we reheat them, there's a possibility that they can cause reheated rice syndrome. That is, by ingestions of the preformed spores of the bacillus cereus that is there, they can cause the, the disease. So keeping the rice warm results in germinations of the spores and enterotoxin formation. So if the rice is warm, the spores will germinate and there will be enterotoxin formation. The emitting type will cause nausea and vomiting within one to five hours. There are two types, that is emitting and diarrheal type, okay? If it's emitting type, this will cause the damage in one to five hours. And if it's a diarrheal type, this will cause the damage in eight to 18 hours, eight to 18 hours, one to five hours and eight to 18 hours over here. The name of the toxin that is produced is cellulite. The name of the toxin produces cellulite. And this is the toxin that can cause the damage in um, the emetic type more, more or less. And the, the management is very easy. All you have to do is you have to give supportive care that is you prescribe broad spectrum antibiotics and IV fluid and uh, patient resuscitation. So that's that. So very easy to understand. The most common questions are going to come from the fact that the patient has had a history of eating outside, taking home a food such as fried rice, keeping it in the fridge and then reheating the rice and eating it. And now the patient has nausea or diarrhea. So that's that. That is bacillus cereus. Okay. Are we clear? In food poisoning, do we give antibiotics? We usually do not give antibiotics because they're self-limiting, okay? But if it's an immunocompromised patient and it's um, it's not it's 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 not getting well by itself, then we prescribe antibiotics. Okay, are we clear? Okay, so uh, can I give you guys one minute, only one minute to go through, to go through these organisms before we move on to coronary bacterium tip three, so that I can ask you some fast questions and then we can do a very quick revision and then we can move on to Clostridia. Yes or no, is that a good idea? Yes or no? Can I give you guys one to two minutes to just go through them very fast? The most of uh, most of the things you'll go through very fast uh, at home after the lecture, but only for now, some of the things I discussed, I just wanna make sure that, okay, two minutes, I'll give you guys two minutes. Just go through them very fast and then I'll, I'll ask you the questions, okay? It's 10.24, I'll give you guys two minutes, just go through them.
Okay, is everyone ready? Okay, uh, Viridin streptococci, the only thing I mentioned was the patients who will get Viridin streptococcal, uh, Viridin, Viridin streptococcal endocarditis will have subacute endocarditis. By subacute endocarditis, we mean that these patients would have infections of a valve which was previously damaged, okay? So it, uh, the infection will not happen on a valve which was not damaged previously. So that's, that's, what, that's what we mean. If it's uh, acute endocarditis, the most uh, common organism we think about is Staphylococcus aureus. If, uh, and the most common presentation is an IV drug user. If it's not an IV drug user, what we think about is immunocompromisations. That's that, okay? And then we also talked about Streptococcus bovis. If it's also Streptococcus bovis, then we think about colon cancer. Then if there's another organism, which is Vibrio parahemolyticus. If it's Vibrio parahemolyticus, then we think about hemochromatosis. Yes, what is the next question? What is the next question? Okay. Did you guys get a chance to do a quick revision? Yes or no? Can you guys hear my voice? If periplasmic space is only in gram negative, can we assume that beta lactamase is only gram negative? Uh, beta lactamase is more in gram negative, yes, but it's also uh, it, it can also be present to some extent in gram positive, but higher chance it's there on gram negatives. So yes. Okay. Can we begin with Clostridia? Is everyone ready? Do you guys hear my voice? Is everyone ready? Okay, Clostridium. Clostridium is one of the most highest yield organism which we will talk about right now. Okay, first of all, Clostridium gram positive or gram negative? Fast answers, please. Gram positive, bacillus, cocci, or branching filament? Bacillus, Arabic or anaerobic? And Arabic, very good. Spore forming or not spore forming? Okay. So uh, let me talk about these, these organisms in a blank page at first. So Clostridium, okay, Clostridium, we have Clostridium tetany, we have Perfringes, Botulinum, and we have Difficile. So there are four subtypes of Clostridia. First of all, the first one is we have concluded that all of these organisms, they are gram positive, they are bacilli, they are bacilli and they are anaerobic, they are anaerobic, okay? So that's that, okay? So these organisms, we have Clostridium tetany and an, another one there is that all of them, they are spore forming organism, they are spore forming organism. So Clostridium, these are uh, these organisms, the first organism is Clostridium tetany. Uh, we, know that it, we know that it causes a very high yield and very common disease known as tetanus. Okay, and the spores that are formed from tetany, uh, from Clostridium tetany, these spores, these spores, they can they can survive outside in uh, um, on, for example, on uh, on um, unclean and dirty surfaces, especially if there's an accident. Uh, for example, they are there on uh, roads, and if the wound is not cleaned properly, then there's a high possibility for these types of infection to happen. So tetanus. What happens with tetanus is that tetanus, the, the spore that is Clostridium tetany, this releases a toxin known as tetanospasmin. Tetanospasmin. Tetanospasmin, what, what this does is, if this is, if this is, uh, okay, if this is a uh, neurotransmission of GABA, we know that after, after, after GABA is formed, 
okay? It fuses with the vesicles, the GABA is released in the synaptic cleft, and then the GABA goes and the binds into the postsynaptic receptor, and then it, it causes its inhibitory or, or stimulatory. Which, which function will it perform, inhibitory or stimulatory? Inhibitory, okay, very good. <clears throat> very good, it will perform its inhibitory action. So in order for this to get released, it needs the help of a protein known as snare, snare protein, okay? Soluble NSF attachment receptor protein, okay? So, so snares. So what tetanospasmin, what this does is, this goes and it attacks the snare. As a result, GABA is not released. Since GABA is not released, there's overactivation with acetylcholine. And as a result, patients have spastic paralysis. So patients have spastic paralysis. Along with GABA, another high yield neurotransmitter is not released, then that neurotransmitter is glycine, okay? GABA and glycine, these are not released. So uh, what happens is as a result, you have um, overactivation resulting in spastic paralysis and patients have this sort of a presentation that is known as they have locked jaw, that is the jaw is locked, they cannot they cannot uh, talk pro they cannot talk properly because there's spastic paralysis of the facial muscle. Then we have another one that is rhesus sardonicus. This is known as um, this is known as the devil smile. Okay, <laughs> have you guys seen the Joker in Batman? How he smiles? Yes or no? Have you guys seen the Joker? In the, in the movie Batman, right? There's a certain smile which we have that is a rhesus sardonicus type smile over there, which the same patients of tetanus they have. Another one is that in, in, extreme, in extreme conditions, these patients, they become, they have a curved back all the way like this. They have a carving of the back. And this carving of the back, this is due to extreme spastic paralysis of the back muscle. And this is known as opisthotonus. This is known as opistho. This is known as opistotonus. Okay, this the, the extreme spastic paralysis of the back muscle. Okay, just give me one second, please. Okay, so can you guys hear my voice? Yes or no? Okay, good. So they have. So we were talking about Clostridium tetany, which produces tetanus. The toxin is tetanospasmin, cleaves snare, prevents the release of GABA and glycine. There is extreme overactivation of acetylcholine, resulting in spastic paralysis, resulting in prismus, rhesus sardonicus, and opisthotonus. Okay, Christmas is log jaw, rhesus sardonicus is devil smile, and opisthotonus is curving of the back muscle. Okay, there is curving of the back back muscle. Are we clear about this? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. Okay. Good. So uh, since tetanus is. Um, uh, is, is highly important. I was thinking that uh, for, to not confuse tetanus with botulinum, is it, is it possible to watch a small video of Clostridium botulinum? 
Yes or no? For Clostridium botulinum only. If we watch the video for Clostridium botulinum, then uh, we will not confuse botulinum with Clostridium tetany, okay? We are not going to watch the video for Clostridium tetany because we want to make sure that we do not make the mistake that Clostridium botulinum will prevent the release of acetylcholine and tetanus will prevent the release of GABA and lysine. So to make sure that we don't uh, make, mix up these two things, we will watch a small video for um, from, from physio for Clostridium. Okay, just give me one second, let me find it out. Okay. Would it anyone be kind enough to take a picture of this? Okay, okay, Dr. Hassam, would you be kind enough to take a picture of this one and post it or, or is there anyone else? Okay. Is everyone ready? Welcome to section two of bacteria. This is our bacteria overview thing. Is everyone ready? If you guys are ready, can I please get a yes in the chat box? So we're just going to watch one video to make sure that we do not mix up GABA and glycine with acetylcholine. Okay, let's get this started. Clostridium botulinum, which you can see right here. This scene takes place in a secret underground robot fighting arena. The fight is a highly anticipated event, as you can probably tell from the large crowd off to the side watching the suspense. The orange robot is the defending champion of the world, so his title is on the line. The bot fight scene should help you remember Clostridium botulinum. So bot fight for Clostridium botulinum. Okay, before we go any further, do you notice anything unique about the background? That's right. We've used purple colors to help reinforce the idea that Clostridium botulinum is a gram-positive organism. So purple background for gram-positive organism. This is a gram stain of Clostridium botulinum. At the end of the bacilli, you can see the spores right here. Notice that the organism stains purple and is rod-shaped. Okay, moving on, notice that we've added this underground crime lord to the scene. He illegally organizes these events because he knows that every time he destroys another robot, he'll make a lot of money. As you can see, he's wearing a mask to help cover up his identity, just in case this party is crashed by law enforcement. Just like in the last video, we're using a mask here to help you remember that Clostridium botulinum is an obligate anaerobe. Again, the mask covers the face and nose, making it harder to breathe, just like anaerobic organisms require less oxygen for proper growth. So face mask for obligate anaerobe. Okay, let's see who he's fighting. It's a homemade purple robot made from used canned food. This cheap homemade robot here is to help you remember that improperly canned food allows the spores of Clostridium botulinum to germinate. The anaerobic environment of canned food facilitates growth of the organism and allows it to produce a preformed toxin. So adults are most commonly affected by the disease when they ingest this preformed toxin after eating improperly canned food. Therefore, eating improperly canned food can be a risk factor for developing Clostridium botulinum. So again, homemade canned robot for canned food. Just like you probably guessed, the homemade canned robot didn't stand a chance. Notice that the orange robot has pulled off the canned robot's leg, causing the canned robot to begin falling towards the ground. The fact that the canned robot is falling to the ground, or descending towards the ground, should help you remember that Clostridium botulinum can cause descending paralysis. The paralysis usually affects the cranial nerves first, then moves downward, affecting the trunk, arms, legs, and diaphragm. If you logically think about this paralysis, you should be able to deduce many of the symptoms. So starting from the head and going down, it causes diplopia, dysarthria, dysphagia, and eventually widespread paralysis involving the diaphragm, which results in respiratory failure. We'll include a few of these symptoms in our picture as we go along, but you shouldn't have to memorize each of them if you just understand that the infection results in descending paralysis. So again, descending canned robot for descending paralysis. Also notice that the orange robot is spraying his opponent with some yellow looking glue stuff. You may not have noticed, but it's actually honey. The honey is a surprise tactic used by the orange robot to trap and destroy his opponent. The honey here should help you remember that Clostridium botulinum spores are commonly found in honey. Infants don't have competitive bowel flora like adults, so they're especially at risk of developing infection after the ingestion of spores found in honey. 
This is why it's advised that infants avoid honey until they are at least 12 months old. As the canned robot is being destroyed, a new contender is waiting in line for a chance to fight the world champion. This kid's name is Hero, and he likes to build robots for fun because he's wicked smart. Don't be fooled by his robot. It looks like a small little baby robot, but it's actually incredibly powerful, and this underground crime lord is about to learn a thing or two about building robots. If you look closely at Hero's baby robot, it looks kind of floppy. This floppy baby robot is here to help you remember that when infants ingest spores of Clostridium botulinum, they can present with a flaccid paralysis known as floppy baby syndrome. Also notice that Hero is holding some M&Ms as he enjoys the fight. In the last video, we used a snail to represent spores, but in this video, we thought a package of M&Ms would be more fitting. M&Ms are similar to snails though, because both have an outer shell, just like a spore has a tough, durable covering. So the M&Ms in this image should help you remember that Clostridium botulinum is a spore-forming organism. Okay, now let's turn our attention back to the honey. The yellow sticky honey isn't just used for eating. It's also a good weapon in a robot fight. You see, honey is super sticky, which is why robots are extremely afraid of it. In this scene, you could say that the honey has trapped or ensnared the canned robot. So in this instance, it's also used to represent a snare. Just like in the Clostridium tetani video, Clostridium botulinum also produces an exotoxin that cleaves snare proteins. This figure was shown in the last video, but the process is essentially the same, so we'll show it again here. Notice the snare proteins right here. These are responsible for releasing neurotransmitters into the synaptic cleft. The exotoxin of Clostridium tetani cleaves snare proteins associated with releasing GABA and glycine, as you can see in the image right here. However, the exotoxin of Clostridium botulinum cleaves snare proteins associated with releasing acetylcholine. So just imagine from this image that we'll cross this out and we're dealing with acetylcholine. Because acetylcholine is a stimulatory neurotransmitter, inhibition of acetylcholine results in paralysis. So acetylcholine is stimulatory, therefore if the toxin inhibits acetylcholine, then this would result in paralysis. So Clostridium botulinum causes paralysis and Clostridium tetani causes sustained muscle contraction. So they're basically opposite from one another. Hopefully now that you understand the mechanism and the neurotransmitters involved, this makes more sense. So how are you going to remember that acetylcholine is associated with Clostridium botulinum? Well, at Physio, we like to make things easy for you. So we've included this idea in our image. Notice anything different about the canned robot's head? He has a single eye that's shaped kind of like a seat. This seat here is to help you remember that the toxin prevents the release of acetylcholine. Seed sounds kind of like acetylcholine, so we've used it in this image to represent acetylcholine. This girl is the one who made the canned robot, and now she has placed a remote control on the ground as she watches her robot being brutally destroyed. Pay close attention to her mouth. Notice that her mouth is wide open in disbelief. This is because she's heartbroken at her loss and doesn't know what to say. The wide open mouth here should help you remember that Clostridium botulinum can cause dysarthria. Okay, now let's turn our attention back to the underground crime lord. Notice that he's wearing sunglasses to also help obscure his identity. Sunglasses make everything darker, and at night it can make things especially difficult to see. So in this scene, the sunglasses are here to help you remember that infection can cause blurred vision. We've also added a bow tie on him to look appropriately dressed for this big occasion. After all, his robot is the undisputed world champion, so he needs to look nice for the occasion. The bow tie is here to help you remember that diluted Clostridium botulinum toxin can be administered as a medication. The toxin-derived medication is known as Botox. Botox can be used for muscle spasms, achalasia, headaches, and for other therapeutic and cosmetic reasons. So, bow tie for Botox. Finally, we've added this circular arena with little spikes at the edges to make the fight extra thrilling. The contestants have to be extremely careful because if the robots step too far in any direction, they may land on a spike and lose the fight. Notice how the little spikes around the arena look like immunoglobulins. This is to help you remember that Clostridium botulinum infection should be treated with human botulinum immunoglobulin. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, right now, will, will it be easy for you guys to remember which one prevents the release of uh, GABA and glycine and which one prevents the release of acetylcholine? So that's that. So uh, basically, our goal of the video was um, to make sure that you guys do not mess up GABA and glycine for tetanus and botulinum. Well, that's what I call it. So right now, if we talk about botulinum toxin, the botulinum toxin will inhibit the release of instead of GABA, it will in, it will in, it will prevent the release of acetylcholine, and as a result, the patients will get uh, flaccid paralysis. 
And the most common way, can you guys tell me what uh, from the video, what you learned about the most common source of botulinum toxin? Botulinum toxin for young babies, for babies. Honey, there we go, very good, okay. So a lot of babies, they get honey when they are born, uh, especially in third world countries, it's a very common uh, habit, okay. So uh, what happens is, when they do that, uh, they don't realize that they're actually uh, letting the baby have botulinum toxin, which can result in floppy baby syndrome. So uh, what we have to do is uh, we have to make sure that uh, if the babies get flaccid paralysis, we have to treat them first with human botulinum immunoglobulin. Uh, the symptoms of botulinum toxins are basically all with these. They can cause diplopia, okay? As you can see over here, that this sunglasses for diplopia, then this bow tie is for dysarthia, uh, this, uh, um, uh, this, um, this girl over here with open mouth for dysarthia, then there's dyspnea and dysphagia. So this bow tie on the throat is for dysphagia and there's also dyspnea. So there are, everything is with the D. Okay, for all the new students, uh, did you like the use of our physio videos? Yes or no? The new students? Are you guys still with us? Uh, do we have the new students who are here with us? I'm not sure. Have they left? Okay. Here we have Dr. Allison and that's all. Okay, Dr. Allison. Okay, so that's that. That is um, botulinum. Okay. Now, let's go back to first aid. Let's talk about these two first. Are we clear about tetanus and botulinum? Okay. Okay. There's also there's uh, there's another thing which I need you to write uh, on the side of botulinum toxin, okay? Over here, if you have a patient with botulinum toxin, uh, the if you have a patient with, with Clostridium botulinum, uh, please write down that this causes blockade of both muscarinic and nicotinic receptors. Please write that down. Blockage will result in blocking of both muscarinic and nicotinic as acetylcholine is not released. So muscarinic and nicotinic receptor will not work. Okay, so inhibition of, don't write block, write down inhibition, inhibition of muscarinic and nicotinic receptor. Please write that down. And write down that in compared to TCA overdose, that is tricyclic antidepressant overdose, which also result in anticholinergic activity, there's only blockage of muscarinic. Okay, write this down over here that in Clostridium botulinum, you have muscarinic and nicotinic receptor inhibition for TCA overdose, that is tricyclic antidepressant overdose, you only have muscarinic blockage. Did you guys write that down, yes or no? Okay, okay. now. Clostridia is a gram-positive spore-forming obligate anaerobic rod. Okay, over here you have Clostridium tetanum. I mean, Clostridium tetanus and Clostridium uh, botulinum. Both toxins are protease toxin that will cleave snare proteins that is involved in neurotransmission. The well, first uh, Clostridium we talked about was Clostridium tetany, which produces tetanospasmin. It's an exotoxin which can prevent the release of GABA and glycine from Rinshaw cells or anterior horn cells of the spinal cord. As a result, this can cause spastic paralysis, Christmas, locked jaw, which is, or rhesus sardonicus, which is devil's uh, uh, devil smile, and opisthotonus. This is prevented with tetanus vaccine, and it, first of all, when we get a patient with tetanus, do we first prescribe vaccine or do we prescribe immunoglobulin? Fast answers, please. First, you prescribe preformed vaccine that is immunoglobulin, and then you, you prescribe tetanus vaccine. So you provide antitoxin plus vaccine with a booster dose, okay? Then you can give antibiotics, and if the patients start having full-blown tetany, then you can give them diazepams and wound debridement should be done, okay? So that's that. 
Next one. Next one is Clostridium botulinum. Clostridium botulinum is uh, another type of spore forming Clostridia that results in uh, flaccid paralysis, also known as botulism. In adults, the disease is caused by ingestion of preformed toxin, and in babies, it's caused by ing ingestion of spores, especially in honey, that leads to the, the disease that is floppy baby syndrome. It is treated with human botulinum immunoglobulin. We also use botulinum for the treatment of uh, for cosmetic purposes. That is, a lot of people use local botulinum toxin, that is Botox. It is ingested to treat focal dystonia, hyperhidrosis, muscle spasm, and cosmetic reduction of facial wrinkles. We know a lot of celebrities use Botox, right? Botox toxins to look younger. So this prevents wrinkles. So that's, that's that. The symptoms are very easy to understand. The symptoms are all with Ds. Ds for D for diplopia, dysarthia, dysphagia, and dyspnea. So the patient cannot see, cannot talk, cannot uh, breathe, and they cannot eat. Okay. So they cannot talk, they cannot breathe, they cannot eat, they cannot see. Diplopia. So that's that. That is Clostridium botulinum. Are we clear about these two Clostridia? Yes or no? Over here, what I asked you guys to write down was Clostridium botulinum will prevent, will cause inhibition of both muscarinic and nicotinic receptors of cholinergic system, and TCA overdose will only prevent muscarinic blockage, not nicotinic. Okay. Yes, what is your question? What is your question? Yes, both toxins will destroy snare. Okay. Yes, and they have different mechanisms. At the same time, yes, that's what they have. Okay. Next one is Clostridium perfringes. Clostridium perfringes or uh, necrotoxin. This is basically an alpha toxin known as lecithinus. It's a phospholipase that can cause myonecrosis, right? Gas gangrene, and they present as soft tissue crepitus and hemolysis. Okay, Clostridium perfringes can cause two types of two types of damage. First of all, they can cause myonecrosis, and they can also cause food poisoning. Okay, so if it's ingested by the GI tract, the spore contaminated food is cooked but left standing for too long at 60 degrees Celsius, the spores will germinate. And vegetative bacteria will result in heat labile enterotoxin that can cause food poisoning symptoms in 10 to 12 hours. Okay, so this is Clostridium perfringes. Clostridium perfringes, the fact that the um, uh, the fact that the enzyme is lecithinase, this lecithinase enzyme is high, highly, it's high, uh, it's high yield for the fact that it can cause gas gangrene. Okay, so gas gangrene, it's also called necrotoxin. So alpha toxin, it's a Lecithinase. Don't forget this. Did we study this when we studied the exotoxin? Yes or no? Okay, good. Next one is Clostridium is Clostridiodis difficile or Clostridium Clostridium difficile. Okay. Uh, how common is the fact of having um, GI bleeding? Okay, especially uh, during defecation after you have been treated with clindamycin. How common is this question? A patient who was previously treated with clindamycin now has GI bleeding. This is due to the fact that Clostridium difficile is, is, is causing pseudomembranous colitis. This is basically the this bacteria, it produces two types of toxin, toxin A and toxin B, which damages the enterocytes. This damage to the enterocyte results in um, watery diarrhea and pseudomembranous colitis. And this is often due to either clindamycin or patients can also have Clostridium difficile with the use of uh, PPIs, right? Like lansoprazole, or S omeprazole, omeprazole, and all of those things. So PPIs are also there. So clindamycin is number one, and then you have PPIs. Where, uh, where do we use clindamycin? When, where do we use metronidazole? Clindamycin. Above the diaphragm for clindamycin and below the diaphragm, we use metronin, metronidazole. Uh, so, all types of gram negatives and uh, anaerobic organisms that can cause infections above the diaphragm, we would like to use clindamycin, and everything below the diaphragm, we would like to use metronidazole. This uh, diagnosis is done by polymerase chain reaction or antigen detection of one or both toxins in the stool. And the complication is toxic megacolon. This is how you. The difficile will cause diarrhea. The treatment is we have to prescribe vancomycin 
metronidazole or fidoxamycin, okay? Out of all the treatments for clostridium difficile, fidoxamycin is more commonly tested, fidoxamycin. So don't, don't forget this, put your star mark over here. For recurrent cases, consider prior regimen or fecal microbiota transplantation. So over here, if fidoxamycin does not work, then what we can do is, in order to treat clostridium difficile, we can actually transplant fecal microbia. That is, we can actually uh, transfer this one type of uh, microorganisms, which can help fight off by competitive growth. So fecal microbiota transplant, that is another one. But uh, the most commonly tested one is fidoxamycin, okay? Are we clear? Can we move on to uh, coronibacterium diphtheri? Yes, what is your question? Please ask the question as fast as possible. If needed, if needed, unmute yourself. Can you explain Botox use for anesthetic? Botox is botulinum toxin, which is used to cause, uh, uh, which is used to cause hype, used to cause hypohidrosis, right? Decrease sweating, muscle. Uh, this this is also used to prevent muscle ring, uh, facial wrinkles. Okay, so as a result, a lot of people use Botox toxin, which is type A botulinum toxin, to prevent wrinkles and look younger. That is all. Okay. Can we start with Cornibacterium diphtheri? Okay. Cornibacterium diphtheri, it's a gram positive rod. First of all, is it, it's gram positive, it's a bacilli. Is it Arabic or an Arabic? Is it Arabic or an Arabic? Arabic, okay. Which type of uh, toxin is being released from coronary bacterium diphtheri? Fast answers, please. Which type of toxin is being released from coronary bacterium diphtheri? We learned the toxin. Diphtheria toxin. What is the mechanism of action of diphtheria toxin? Inhibits elongation factor two. Okay, very good. Okay, so diphtheria toxin. Uh, first of all, it's a gram-positive bacillus. It's Arabic. It occurs in angular. Uh, it occurs in angular arrangements. Basically, this this is how it looks like on growth medium. This is how. This looks like an angular pattern. For example, one growth will be one angular to an, an, another one, okay? So an angular pattern, it looks almost like a branching filament, but it's not, it's bacillus. It's transmitted via respiratory droplets. It's caused by diphtheria toxin, which is encoded by beta prophage, okay? Beta prophage encoded. This is not a very high, so don't worry about this. It's beyond the scope of step one to understand beta prophage. It's a exotoxin that inhibits protein synthesis via ADP ribosylation of elongation factor two. And this inhibits protein synthesis. If, it, if there's inhibition of proteins, protein synthesis, will there be host cell death? Yes or no? Will there be host cell death? Yes. As a result, can we also assume that there's necrosis? If there's necrosis, can we assume there is a formation of a pseudomembrane? Okay, so this results in possible necrosis and pseudomembrane formation. This is known as pseudomembranous pharyngitis. That is a grayish white membrane that forms over here and this travels all the way across the buccal mucosa. And this can also go down causing the dyspnea and a possible respiratory uh, collapse. So what happens is patients get pseudomembranous pharyngitis with limp adenopathy and the toxin dissemination may cause myocarditis. Along with this, this can cause myocarditis, arrhythmia and neuropathy. So and along with this one, if the toxin goes, they also have a tendency of, of attacking the myocardium. This can cause uh, this this can cause life-threatening myocarditis, arrhythmia. And with arrhythmia, we know that there's a possibility with having ventricular arrhythmia, fibrillation, tachycardia, and then I mean tachycardia, fibrillation, and then sudden cardiac death. So that is also one of the ways patients can die with coronary bacterium diphtheria. So do not forget this. Lab diagnosis is based on gram-positive rod with metachromatic blue granules and 
positive elect test. This is extremely high yield. So on lab diagnosis, the uh, granules that are there in dip theory, they look like metachromatic blue and red granules. Okay, metachromatic blue and red granules. Coronary bacterium dip three organisms, they're basically club shaped. So if you can see that this organism, they will look something like this in the growth medium, okay? Like um, all, all, almost like this one, like a club shaped metachromatic granules and the media is low flux media cane. Is there any other media for um, coronary bacterium dip three, which we studied before? Any other media? Telluride agar, very good, good. This is so you will see black black colonies on tail right agar and club shaped on low flares medium. So and I uh, don't and the most commonly tested things over here is the toxin. The fact that it inactivates elongation factor two will be asked in sixty to eighty percent of the time, and also the fact that identification by saying that it's a metachromatic blue granules, metachromatic blue granules for coronary bacterium diphtheria. So the way I would like to, I would like for you guys to remember this is when you think about diphtheria, think about, think about a golf club, think about a golf club like this. Okay. For example, this is a golf club. Think about a golf club. This is club shaped and metachromatic blue, red and blue, red. Okay metachromatic blue and red. So, so the blue and red golf club, try to think about this one when you think about corny bacterium diphtheria for the club shape and the blue and red color of the club. Okay, blue and red color for the metachromatic blue and red granules. So try to remember this diagram for corny bacterium, dip, for, for corny bacterium diphtheria and you should be good. Okay, okay. Can we move on to the stereo? Yes or no? Listeria. Okay. Dr. Wasam, do they do do they test elect test? All they will tell you about elect test is for the toxin, they will tell you that elect test is positive. They will not go into the details of elect test. Okay. They will not go into the details of elect test. Okay, let's talk about listeria. First of all, listeria, is it gram positive or gram negative? Listeria, listeria is gram positive. Uh, is it a bacilli cocci or a branching filament? It's a bacilli. Okay. Um, okay. Now, uh, is it Arabic or anaerobic? Good. It is Arabic. So it's a gram positive bacilli, which occurs by ingestion of. It's a it's a gram positive uh, bacilli, which. It's a gram positive uh, bacilli, which occurs by ingestion of um, the most common source of, in, of ingestion. I mean, the most common source of infection is, most common source of infection is ingestion of Delhi food. Over here, we have a lot of delis. I'm not sure if you guys know what a deli is. Basically, delis are groceries which sells um, which sells stored meat as stored meat or cured meat, and they use it in sandwiches. Okay, so this meat product or this meat this meat product is highly contaminated with listeria. It's highly contaminated with listeria. And the problem with this one is if the fact that these meat, they're stored in the refrigerator or in the cold favors the growth of this organism because this organism has a tendency to grow at a temperature of four to 10 degrees Celsius. So it's a very big problem because we like to store our food at cold temperature, but we have to keep in mind that the only organism that can grow in these type of uh, environment is listeria. So if you have any patient who has, uh, for example, um, for example, a disease, uh, for example, a disease with listeria, 
after ingestion of um, meat products, then you have to you have to understand that that meat product might have been refrigerated at a temperature of four to ten degrees Celsius. So, do you guys realize how there are sometimes uh, some food when you have it straight out from the fridge, you feel a bit you feel a bit um, sick because you did not properly reheated the food properly, for example. Yes or no? Okay. So if, if there has been some case of uh, you feeling like that, then there's a possibility that there might have been a mild listeria infection. So that's that. Okay, so this is occurred by, this happens by ingestion of deli meat. And this is one of the most common ways you will get your questions from the step one. Okay, what happens is from over here, uh, listeria, they cause rock, they have a rocket tail movement. As you can see over here, that listeria, they have a rocket tail movement. So first of all, it's a gram-positive intracellular rod, which occurs by ingestions of dairy products and cold deteli meats. And there is transplacental transmission by vaginal uh, or, or vaginal transmission during birth. So uh, not only can you get list listeria by ingestion of dairy products and cold deli meat, you can also get listeria by, veg by vaginal transmission. And uh, this grows on refrigerated temperature and on, um, on, on the culture, this has a rocket tail appearance. Vi and what happens is this rocket tail appearance has an, has an actin uh, polymerization that allows intracellular movement and cell to cell spread across cell membrane. What happens over here, let's say you have one cell and since these are intracellular organism, listeria, what, what, what they do is, instead of moving outside of the cell, they have an actin polymerization, which moves from one cell to another cell, and then from another cell to another cell. And that's how they keep on spreading throughout the whole body. So they have an actin polymerization, which helps in intracellular transport of the bacteria. Okay, intracellular transport of the bacteria. And uh, what happens is, when that happens, do you realize that our, our, our serum, it contains antibody, but since the organism is not there outside in the, uh, in the serum, the antibody cannot go and work over there, uh, there properly. So that's why they can escape immune attack by antibodies. They have a characteristic tumbling motility in broth, that is they move like this, okay? They keep on moving like this, like they have a tumbling motility, almost like a wave. The infections that are caused by listeria is amniotitis, septicemia, spontaneous abortion, and that's that. The most common uh, presentation is amniotitis and septicemia in pregnant women after eating deli food. This is very, very high yield. This is very, very high yield. So cold deli meat products is one giveaway. Amniotitis and septicemia, especially in pregnant women, listeria infections are very, very common. Over there, if, if uh, you have a pregnant woman with listeria infection, you would want to treat them with ampicillin as soon as possible. Another type of infection that it causes is known as granulomatous, uh, granulomatosis inf infantaseptica. It's called granulomatosis infantaseptica. And that means that there is disseminated listeria infection, which can, which can cause uh, early septicemia and death in young babies. Also, the treatment for that one is also ampicillin. They can also cause meningitis in neonates, adults, and immunocompromised patients. And at times, for example, do you remember that time when I asked you that, that, that did you get sick when you had food from the fridge instead of reheating it and you said yes, that is also due to mild listeria infection. And in mild infection, patients can actually get better because they're self-limiting, okay? So that is all. Are we clear about listeria? Yes or no? Listeria, are we clear about this? Okay. What is the source of infection of listeria? Okay. Always remember, please write this down over here. In preterm babies, write this down. In preterm babies, listeria infection is more common. Preterm, that is uh, before the normal week of, uh, before the normal time of delivery. Right, preterm babies, listeria infections are more common. Okay, is everyone clear? Mm -hmm. Okay, can we move on to the next one? Can we do a break? Okay, 
fine, we can take a break. Does everyone want a break? Before we go on their break, are we understanding microbiology uh, uh, properly or not? Yes or no? Okay. How long do you guys want to take the break for? Fifteen minutes. Okay. So let's take a break for fifteen minutes, and let's come back. Twenty minutes is too long. Let's take the break for fifteen minutes. Hopefully, by then you will feel recharged. And let's come back at eleven twenty-six. Okay. Let's come back at eleven twenty-six.
Is everyone back from their break? Can you guys hear my voice? Okay. So uh, are you guys understanding microbiology? Yes or no? Is everyone understanding microbiology perfectly? Uh, after we are done with today's discussion and lecture, you guys have to go home and read about all the things we just discussed. You guys remember doing that, right? Yes or no? Because that's what I asked you guys to do. Since we are not taking time to memorize the information right now, we are doing that at home after the lecture. Please don't forget to do that. Okay. <clears throat> Now, are we ready to begin the lecture? Is everyone ready? Can we begin our lecture? Can I get a yes on the chat box if you guys are ready, please? Yes, okay. Okay, good. <clears throat> so um, let's begin the lecture. Uh, first and foremost, the first two bacteria I wanna talk about is I wanna talk about nocardia and I wanna talk about actinomyces. Uh, first and foremost, are these bacteria gram positive or gram negative? Gram positive or gram negative? Fast answers please, gram positive. Are they bacilli, cocci or branching filaments? Branching filaments, very good. Are, now, if there is an Arabic branching filament, if it's Arabic, we learned about nagging pest must breathe. Over here, nagging was for, if it's an Arabic, which branching filament is N? Nocardia. And right, and we also, uh, we also know that if Arabic is nocardia, then N Arabic is actinomyces. So, uh, so actinomyces is, is N Arabic. <clears throat> Okay, so if you have nocardia, we have actinomyces. First of all, both are branching filaments, gram positive, but this is Arabic, this is an Arabic. Okay, now let's talk about actinomyces first. Actinomyces is an Arabic, this is more common than nocardia. Question wise, we know that it, it, it produces oral and facial abscesses known as, um, known as mycetomas, right? And if it it produces oral and facial abscesses over there. If you have a secretion, you see what is the color of the secretion that is going to be due to the presence of what type of granules? Fractinomyces, fast answers, please. Yellow, so yellow colored pus, okay, or yellow color, due to the presence of sulfur granules, okay? Due to the presence of sulfur granules, okay? Now, and then another uh, he easy and high yield thing to remember is the word SNAP, S-N-A-P, in form, in term of treatment. SNAP is weak prescribed sulfonamide for treatment of nocardia, and we prescribe penicillin for the treatment of actinomyces. So for actinomyces, you give penicillin. For nocardia, you give sulfonamides, okay? So that's that. So no cardia is Arabic, actinomyces is, is an Arabic. This is, as, this is weak acid, this is not acid fast. Okay, next is where do we find them? No cardia is found in soil. This is found in <clears throat> oral reproductive and GI tract. And no cardia, it causes pulmonary infections in immunocompromised patients and cutaneous infections and trauma. But basically no cardia infections will tell you that no matter which infection you have, do you realize that pulmonary infections in immunocompromised patients and cutaneous infections in trauma, these things can happen with any other bacteria, yes or no? Yes or no? Okay, so what they will tell you is you have an infection with, a, with an organism and in that organism, when they cultured it, the properties, they will tell you that the organism is gram positive, the filaments are branching and it's an Arabic. It's an Arabic. What type of organism is this? This is what they will tell you in the question stem and your answer should be no cardia. Or if they ask you, what type of treatment do we give for these patients? And then you remember the word SNAP. So it's 
sulfonamides. The same way goes for actinomyces, but for actinomyces, I mean Arabic, not anaerobic, my apologies. My apologies, Arabic. Gram-positive branching filament, Arabic. And for actinomyces, it's gram-positive branching, branching filament and Arabic. And they will tell you that uh, for actinomyces, you have a patient who has an abscess with the yellow sulfur with the yellow sulfur granules. If they mention sulfur granules, then it's very indicative of, of actinomyces, and you're dealing with a mycetoma. So that's that. And then once again, the treatment is with penicillin. Okay, are we clear about this? Yes or no? Are we clear about this? Okay. Now, if we have a patient, okay, PPD stands for where, oh, purified protein derivative, purified protein derivative with the tuberculosis uh, screening test, PPD. Okay. Okay. Before I forget, a small piece of information for Listeria. Listeria, is it a bacteria or a virus? Easy question. Okay. Easy question. Are you sure it's a bacteria? It should be a bacteria because we are studying um, bacteriology, right? It's a very stupid question. My apologies for that. The reason why I'm asking you this is uh, if, if Listeria causes um, meningitis, what type of uh, white blood cell count is high in a bacterial meningitis? In a bacterial meningitis, what type of WBC count is high normally? Neutrophil. Neutrophil, right? Except in listerial meningitis, the white blood cell count will be lymphocyte, not neutrophil. Write this down too. Okay, write this down, not neutrophil. In listerial meningitis, there is high lymphocyte count, not neutrophil count. We'll write this down over here. So you don't confuse viral infection with a bacterial infection because you have this piece of information right now. Okay, can we move on to mycobacteria? Mycobacteria, okay. Do we have Dr. Hassan with us today, Dr. Hassan? Not Dr. Hossam, Dr. Hassan, yes. Dr. Hassan, how, uh, how, how many times did you study mycobacteria in your course of five years of MBBS? Mycobacteria. Okay, everyone else, how many times did you guys study mycobacteria? The reason why I asked Dr. Hassan is because uh, she's from the same curriculum of medical studies as I am. So. Um, a lot of times, right? So every one of us, we are very, very well accustomed to mycobacteria, especially from the country where um, I am originating from. Our, in our country, uh, this is a very big issue. That is tuberculosis is very, very common. Okay, so that's that. So mycobacteria, how common is tuberculosis over here? Yes, in India too. How common is tuberculosis uh, over here? Okay, not common, not common, okay. But we still have to learn this. It's a gram positive acid fast rod. Okay, it's acid fast. Uh, that is, it will show pink rods in A. Uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis is often resistant to multiple drugs and micro, we have mycobacterium tuberculosis, mycobacterium avium intracellulary, mycobacterium scrofulaceum and mycobacterium mer merinum. Each of these things will cause different types of problems, but mycobacterium tuberculosis is one of the most common and the most high yield. So let's talk about this one first. Tuberculosis symptoms are basically fever, night sweats, and weight loss. As simple as that. Fever, night sweats, wet, fever, night sweats, and weight loss, or fever, night sweats, and cough and hemoptysis. Okay, so fever, night sweats, cough, hemoptysis, very, very indicative of tuberculosis. Over here, there's a virulence factor known as cord factor. The cord factor, it creates a serpentine cord appearance in virulent mycobacterium tuberculosis strains, which, and the and the and this virulence factor, cord factor, this will activate the CD14 on macrophage, which can uh, result in granuloma formation. And this induces the release of tumor necrosis factor. And tumor necrosis factor, as we all know, is very high yield for maintaining the shape and size of the granuloma. So that's that. And 
Sulfur TIDS is another virulence factor. This inhibits phagolysosomal fusion. So as a result, they do not have proper immune response. Uh, I mean, there's no proper immune response against the granuloma. So sulfur TID will prevent phagolysosomal fusion and cord factor will prevent. Cord factor will help in macrophage activation, release of TNF, and maintain the shape and size of the granuloma. So that's that. Okay. Now, let's let's see what ha what's happening over here. First of all, let's study this diagram. Over here, as you can see, there's mycobacterium tuberculosis, you, which you ingested. So mycobacterium tuberculosis, the source of infection is respiratory droplets, right? So it, it, it gets infected and then it forms up a, a primary uh, granuloma over here, which, which is known as a GONS focus. And the GONS focus and the higher lymph nodes, both of this which gets affected, this is known as GONS complex. So GONS complex is GONS focus plus affected higher lymph node. Over there, then you have what, what we call as primary tuberculosis. And primary tuberculosis in more than 90% of the cases will get healed by fibrosis and calcification. If it gets reactivated, for example, there are certain diseases uh, name one immunological deficiency disease where there is uh, recurrent uh, recurrent activation of tuberculosis or disseminated tuberculosis. Fast, please. Well, what, well, what is the name of the immunodeficiency disease? IL-12 receptor deficiency. Very good. If there's IL-12 receptor deficiency, there is disseminated tuberculosis. Okay. So secondary tuberculosis can happen for which um, uh, you can get fibrocaceous uh, cavitary lesion, usually in the upper lobes, right? Or what happens is that this could also cause disseminated infection, and this, this can go from the lungs to anywhere in the body, basically. For example, this can go from the lungs to even the kidneys causing caseation, and the necrosis is caseating uh, necrosis. This can spread in the blood, and in the blood, after they spread, just like how a cancer goes and, uh, I mean, just like how a tumor goes and metastasizes in different organs, the tuberculosis also has the tendency of spreading through the blood instead of the lymph node and then going to different organs and causing damage. For example, in the long bones, it can go to the long bones, kidney, spleen, in the spine, which is which we call POS disease, right? In the spine, it's called POS disease, so that's that. And it can also cause meningitis, that's also another one. This usually happens in case of AIDS, but uh, that's that, or immunocompromisation. So what we do is we can do an interferon gamma release assay, which is known as IGRA, which has false positive than BCG, uh, which has fewer false positives from BCG vaccination. In certain BCG vaccinations, you can get uh, positive tuberculosis, but that is due to the fact that it's um, they gave the non-pathogenic um, strains to induce an immune response. So that's that. And purified protein derivative uh, positive if current infection or past exposures. This is a screening test. And PPD is negative if there's no infection or sarcoidosis or HIV is uh, with a CD4 count, which is less. PPD is not very commonly tested in USMB step one, that is for sure. But PPD is basically a purified protein derivative is basically a screening test where we see the area of induration in the skin after we inject PPD. If there's a patient with tuberculosis infection, it will be more than 10 uh, centimeter. If it's uh, if it's not negative, it will be less than 10, 10 centimeter. But uh, we don't usually do this sorts of uh, sorts of screening test anywhere anymore, so it's not commonly tested. So don't worry about this. Caseating granulomas with central necrosis and Langerhans giant cell. Uh, single exposure are characteristic of, of secondary tuberculosis. Okay, that's that. The granulomas are basically caseating granulomas. The granuloma, as you can see over here, is that there's a central necrosis surrounded by a layer of epithelioid cells that is giant macrophages. So this is the granuloma they're talking about. That is mycobacterium tuberculosis. Then we also have mycobacterium AVM intracellulary, which causes disseminated non-tuberculosis disease. Okay, and um, this, um, this is not very high yield either, except there's one question about mycobacterium marinum. I'm going to put a star over here. Okay. That is, uh, they try to see whether you understand that there, that in a patient, what the question goes something like this, that it's an aquarium worker who was feeding the aquarium. And after that, he came up with uh, some sort of hand infections, which is gram positive organism. What type of organism is this most likely to be? So um, the answer is mycobacterium marinum. The reason being is because gram positive after um, cleaning aquarium is very indicative of mycobacterium marinum. So that is one question. So put your star mark over here. And obviously mycobacterium tuberculosis is also high yield. So put your star mark for that one. Okay. 
before we finish gram negative and I'm before we finish uh, before we begin gram negative let's move on to leprosy leprosy is also called Hansen disease okay again do we do you want me to repeat mycobacterium tuberculosis again or which one which one do you want me to repeat mycobacterium tuberculosis mycobacterium marinum mycobacterium marinum is infections of the hands in a patient who is who has a history of being an aquarium worker or cleaning an aquarium okay Mycobacterium tuberculosis is a gram-positive infection with an acid-fast organism known as mycobacteria. It's a respiratory uh, droplet infection. It comes at four, and then it colonizes in the lungs. It's, this colonization with hyalur node involvement is known as gone complex. And this can get healed in 90% of the cases. If it doesn't get healed and it gets reactivated, it's called secondary tuberculosis. Or if that doesn't get healed, then over here in cases of immunocompromisation, you can get spreading in the bacteria. I mean, you can get spreading of the bacteria in the blood, and this can go deposit in all the tissues of the body, resulting in different types of problems, right? So they can go, they can go deposit and form granulomas in the liver, lungs, kidneys, spleen, bones, and everywhere else. The granulomas are caseating granulomas with the center of necrosis, central caseous necrosis, surrounded by an epithelioid macrophage cells. Right over here, we can do screening tests. Screening tests, which we commonly do, is IGRA, interferon gamma release assay. But if there's a patient who has had a previous history of BCG vaccination, they can get false positive. If not, the more commonly done test screening test is PPD in third world countries. <clears throat> so PPD is not commonly asked. That's why I did not put a lot of emphasis. There are two types of virulence factor. One is cord factor, another one is sulfur tids. Cord factor will activate the macrophage, gets to the release of tumor necrosis factor, maintain the shape and size of the granuloma, and, su and sulfur tids will inhibit phagolysosomal fusion and prevent an immune response attack. Okay, that is the revision and repetition of mycobacterium tuberculosis. Are we clear now? Okay, can we move on to leprosy? Leprosy. Leprosy. How common is leprosy? Lepers. How common is leprosy? Now, now nowadays, <clears throat> not common. Okay, not common. But leprosy is it is it eradicated? No. So can leprosy still happen? If there is leprosy in a community, are we in deep, deep trouble? Okay, so that's why this is very high yield. This is because if someone in your family has, has leprosy, is there a possibility that you can contract it from them too? Okay, leprosy is also called Hansen disease. It is caused by Mycobacterium leprae, which is an acid fast bacilli that likes cool temperatures, okay? So that's why there is a very high yield question. That is, why do these organisms colonize in the skin and superficial nerves? The answer is because they like to survive in cool temperatures. Okay, They like to survive in cool temperatures. They are diagnosed via skin biopsy or tissue PCR. And the reservoir in the United States is armadillos. Armadillos, do you guys know what armadillos are? They're found in deserts in Southern America. Okay, Do we have any students over here from Southern America? I highly doubt it. But armadillos, have you ever seen an, an armadillo? They're found in the, and they're found in, and, and, and deserts. Okay, Dr. Nikki, you're from Texas. Have you seen an armadillo? Okay, if you've seen one, please don't go in front of one. You might get Hansen disease, God forbid, because they are one of the most um, biggest reservoir of leprosy, Mycobacterium leprae. There are two types of leprosy, Mac. Lep lepromatous and tuberculoid. Lepromatous leprosy is more um, lepromatous leprosy and tuberculoid leprosy. I'm gonna talk about these two over here, okay? So this is lepromatous, one second. Lepromatous, this is tuberculoid, okay? Now, lepromatous leprosy is, lepromatous leprosy over here the type of immune response that lepromatous lep leprosy will have is they largely, 
they largely rely on Th2 response. On tuberculoid leprosy, they largely rely on Th1 response, okay? And uh, over here, the bacterial load is high, basically meaning that they are more communicable, meaning that they are more, more, they are more dangerous. So it's highly communicable and the bacterial load is high bacterial load. Over here, the bacterial load is low. <clears throat> okay. Now, over here, the presentations are also more severe. So patients have um, leonine feces, right? Leonine feces. Leonine feces, I'm not sure if you guys have seen leonine feces. There's a picture over here, okay? And leonine feces, okay? And over here, what you have is you have hypoesthetic, hypoesthetic and hairless skin, okay? Only you have hairless skin and hypoesthetic, meaning that there is no, uh, there is very little um, pigmentation and um, and temperature sensation. So that's that hairless hypoesthetic region. This is lethal. Lepromatous is lethal. Tuberculosis, tuber tuberculosis is T T four treatable. L four lethal. L four lethal. T four treatable. Tuberculosis is treatable. Okay. Now to treat tuberculosis, I mean to treat uh, Mycobacterium leprosy. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the treatment for tuberculoid one is dapsone and rifampin. And if it's for leprosy, for the lepromatous leprosy, what we use is we use clofazimine. That's all I remember. Let's see <clears throat> if I have touched everything from over here or not. So basically, um, this one is, um, there are two types. One is lepromatous, another one is tuberculoid. Okay, they are more, they have leonine facies, they are lethal, they have high Th2 response and low CMI, meaning the cell mediated immunity over here is low and Th2 is high, and the exact opposite is over here that is cell mediated immunity is high and Th1 response is high and Th2 is not very high. And the bacterial load over here is higher, bacterial load over here is lower. Treatment is dapsone and rifampin for tuberculoid and clofazimine for lepromatous. That is that is the, that is that. Most of the time, you will have questions more from tuberculoid leprosy, not from uh, lepromatous lepromatous leprosy. The questions will be that you have a patient who has hypoesthetic hairless skin plaques, and um, the organisms have colonized in the superficial areas. And what is the reason? for the colonization. The reason for the colonization is because these organisms, they love to thrive in cold temperatures. That's the reason. Are we clear? Yes or no? Are we clear about this? Yes or no? Yes, okay. Okay, so before we begin, can I give you guys uh, two minutes to go over the organisms? Just, just look over the organisms you read from gram positive. Before we begin gram negative, I just want to be sure treatment of lepromatous is clofazimine along with dapsone and rifampin. Clofazimine, it's written over here, clofazimine with dapsone and rifampin. Okay. Before we begin gram negative, before we begin gram negative, just go through the last bacterial organisms which we read to make sure that you don't, um, to make sure that uh, you don't mix it up, okay? This is tuberculoid. No, look, dapsone and rifampin for tuberculoid, clofazimine is added for lepromatous form. Do you understand what I mean? So for lepromatous leprosy, you will give clofazimine along with dapsone and rifampin, okay? Okay. Have you guys understood what I just said? In, uh, before we begin gram negative, go through the organisms one more time. I will ask you questions and then I'll move on to gram negative. How long should I give you guys? Two minutes or five minutes, how long? Five minutes. Does everyone need five minutes to go through the organisms? Okay, I'll give you guys five minutes. Okay, I'll, I'll ask you guys exactly at 11.59, 11.59.
Okay, go through the organisms. I'll ask you questions and then I'll move forward. Yes, Kofazimi is added. Do we have Dr. Adenom with us today, Dr. Adenom? Dr. Adenom. Dr. <clears throat> Dr. Adenom, are, are you here with us today? Dr. Adenom. Okay. Uh, who uh, who else was responsible for um, performing the fifteen minutes um, equation thing on the Facebook discussion group? I remember it was Dr. Adenom. Who else was was responsible? Was it Dr. Jordan? Do we have Dr. Jordan with us today? Dr. Jordan, can you guys hear my voice? Okay. Do we have Dr. Jordan, Dr. Adenom? Uh, who, were you guys supposed to complete the 15 minutes equation thing? Fifteen minutes equation challenge. Yes or no? Are you guys going to perform that uh, anytime soon? If not, then I, I then I have to ask someone else to do it. Or do you guys want to skip out? 
can I get some responses on this on the chat box, please? Okay, Dr. Jordan, no problem. So Dr. Adenom would be performing the 15 minutes equation challenge. When can we expect you to complete the challenge? Today or tomorrow? And who else is interested in performing the challenge? Yes, all the formulas by not looking at the formulas and uploading a video if needed or just uploading a picture of you doing it. Anyone. We would prefer a video, but if the video is not there, then uh, the picture would do. Just want to make sure that you guys are all doing it. That's why I, I want to put a special emphasis on this one to make sure that you guys are doing it. Um, who else wants to perform the challenge? Can we ask, uh, okay, who else, who else can we ask? Can we ask Dr. Hassan, are you there, Dr. Hassan? Are you there? Would you be uh, able to read out all the formulas and then put out a picture or a video of you doing it in 15 minutes? Okay, so Dr. Hassan, Dr. Dahlia, and Dr. Adenom, if possible, make sure that you guys do it and then we'll choose two other people or two other students uh, tomorrow, okay? Now, let's get on with the question. First of all, our first question is, you have an organism which is gram-positive, cocci, catalase-positive, coagulase-positive. What, what organism am I talking about? Okay, you have another organism, gram-positive, cocci, catalase-negative, alpha-hemolytic, optogen-sensitive. Which organism am I talking about? Okay, you have an organism, gram positive, bacilli, and Arabic. Which organism am I talking about? Okay, <clears throat> you have an organism which is gram positive, branching filament, and Arabic. Which organism am I talking about? <clears throat> okay, gram positive, cocci. Catalase negative, beta hemolytic, bacitracin resistant. Which organism am I talking about? Okay. No. Which organism has camp factor? Okay. Which organism will grow in 6.5% sodium chloride? and PYR test is positive. Okay. Which organism has the highest reservoir in armadillos? Okay. Which organism is gram positive cocci um, catalase negative, then it's um, alpha hemolytic and optogene resistant. There it is. Okay. Which organism has cord factor and sulfated as virulence factors? Okay. Which organism? Which organism can cause uh, strawberry tongue, fever, rash, and desquamation? All right, okay. Now, are we ready to begin gram negatives? Do you guys realize how most of the questions are from the table of gram positive table, the table of gram positive organism? Yes or no? Okay. So uh, 
most of you guys, do you guys use use your study room to study or do you guys study in um, libraries of universities? Okay, so the reason why I asked you guys is because is it possible for you guys to is it possible for you guys to take a picture of the gram positive table, print it out and put it on your wall? If it's a library, then we can't ask you to do that. But if, okay, okay. put the picture on the wall in the room where you spend the most, um, with, uh, the, in the room where you spend the most amount of time in. The reason being is because if you just want to give a quick glance on the table, then you can have a quick revision. And with quick revisions, you can have more confidence. So that's that. Now, <clears throat> let's, let's begin with gram negatives. Uh, the first thing that we want to talk about is, first of all, if you have an organism on gram staining, if it's a purple color, it's positive. If it's gram negative, what sort of color are we expecting in this organism, if it's gram negative? What sort of color are we expecting? Blue? Blue is for gram positive. The color that we are expecting is pink. Okay, I'm not sure if this is the pink color. Wait one second. Okay, do we have any pink color over here? Pink. Okay, so the color is pink color for gram negatives. Okay. Okay. Now, gram negative. When you have uh, after a staining, if the color is pink. Then what is the next thing we see? Fast answers, please, for the organism. What is the next thing we see? After seeing the color, shape and size, very good. Shape and size, okay. So the first shape, the first shape, the first shape for gram negative organism, which we want to talk about is diplococci, diplococci, okay. Now, gram-negative diplococci, whenever you hear the name gram-negative diplococci, which organism comes to your mind instantly? Gram-negative diplococci. <clears throat> Nigeria. <clears throat> the first organism you start thinking about is Nigeria. Now, Nigeria, Nigerias are Arabic organisms, meaning that they will be present in the presence of oxygen, so Arabic organism. And the only way to distinguish between Nigerian organism is to do maltose test, maltose, okay? Maltose test. Now, if maltose is positive, which Nigeria has an M in it? Which Nigeria has an M? Meningitis, so which organism will be positive for maltose? M positive for Nigeria, meningitis, okay. Very good. And the negative one is obviously Nigeria gonorrhea. So that's that, okay. So that's that. The next shape that we wanna discuss is, the next shape that we want to discuss with you guys is coccobacilli. What do we mean by coccobacilli? That is, not only does it look like a coccus, it can also look like a bacilli, right? So coccobacilli. <clears throat> okay. Coccobacilli, the organisms are Haemophilus, Bortadella, and then we have, then we have Bruce Wayne for Brucella, then we have a pastor for pastorella. And then we have another uh, female. Her name is Francisca for Francisella. So Bruce Wayne, meaning the Batman and the pastor trying to save a woman known as Francisca for Francisella. That's how I would remember these organisms. So Haemophilus and Bortadella is very easy to remember, right? Then Bruce Wayne and Pastor helping a woman called Francisca is known as Brucella, Pastorella, and Francisella, which are coccobacilli, gram negative coccobacilli. 
Another one is gram negative curved. Okay, gram negative curved rods. Okay, gram negative curved rods. Okay, curved rods. Gram negative curved rods. When whenever we see curving and gram negative, the next uh, the next test that we want to perform is oxidase. Oxidase test. Okay, oxidase. And oxidase is uh, positive to see if it's actually a curved or any other shape. We want to confirm the curved shape because sometimes you can um, distinguish, we, you cannot distinguish properly between the curved shape and the copco bezalline. So you want to perform an oxidase test to confirm the shape that is a curved shape. If it's curved shape, then there are three organisms which we'd like to, which we would like to think about in cases of curved gram negative rods. The first one is if it grows at 42 degrees Celsius, if it grows at 42 degrees Celsius, we know that 42 degrees Celsius is, um, is, is it actually cold or not cold? 42 degrees Celsius. Is it cold or warm? It's hot, right? Okay. So do we like to Okay, uh, we, we, we know a lot of people who would like to camp in this weather, 42 degrees Celsius. Camping at 42 degrees Celsius for which bacteria? What is the name of this bacteria? Camp, camp for Campylobacter jejuni. You would like camping at 42 degrees Celsius. It may be fun or it may not be fun but there are some people who like to camp at 42 degrees Celsius. The bacteria is Campylobacter jejuni, okay? Then, which organism do we do the urea bread test for? Urea bread test, which is gram negative. Helicobacter pylori. Is it urease positive or urease not positive? P chunks, we had protease, then we had chlamydia, right? Then we had Helicobacter, Uroplasma, Nocardia, Klebsiella, Saprophyticus, and Epidermidis. It's urease positive. Positive urease. This is Helicobacter. This is Helicobacter. Okay. Okay. So if it's oxidase positive, urease positive, it's Helicobacter. Another one is, another one is, this can grow in alkaline media. This organism is Vibrio cholerae. Vibrio cholerae. Okay. Okay. So gram negative. This is the broad classification of gram negative, except that we have skipped out on one shape. That shape is a big uh, is a bigger um, classification. So we'll go and talk about this shape over here. Okay. So before we do that, first of all, gram negative diplococci maltose acid detection positive. Which organism are we talking about? Gram negative diplococci maltose acid meningitis. Next one, gram negative coccobacilli. Which organisms are there in gram negative coccobacilli for the mnemonic I just mentioned? <clears throat> gram negative coccobacilli. Hemophilus, then Pasteurella, Bortadella, and Name of the woman. What was the name of the woman? Francisella or Francisca. And Batman's name, the name of Batman. Bruce Wayne. <clears throat> there we go. Bruce Wayne. Okay. <clears throat> then, if it's a gram negative curved, if it's gram negative curved, what, what, what is the next uh, test we do to see if it's actually gram negative curved or not? Oxidase test. If it's oxidase positive and it grows at 42 degrees Celsius, which organism is this? Campylobacter. Okay. If it um, grows in alkaline media, which organism is this? Vibrio. If it produces urease, which organism is this? H. pylori. Now, another one is, let's say we have gram negative, gram negative, this organism. So we had diplococci, we had coccobacilli, 
and we had curved, right? Which we discussed. This one that we're gonna talk about is, this one is purely bacilli. So gram negative bacilli. Gram negative bacilli, uh, if, if it's a bacilli shape, the next test we want to do is, we want to perform a lactose fermentation. We want to perform a lactose fermentation, okay? If it's, if it's lactose positive, if it's lactose positive, we want to see the process at which the lactose fermentation was happening. That, that is, was it a fast lactose fermentation or was it a slow lactose fermentation? If it is, if it is, a, fact, if it is a fast lactose fermenter, there is two organisms high yield, which we think about that is E. coli and Klebsiella. If it's a slow one, we like to think about two low yield organism that is Citrobacter and Ceresia. Citrobacter and Ceresia, the catalyst positive red pigment producing organism which causes diseases in chronic granulomatous disease is this one over here, okay? So lactose positive, if it's a fast one, you think about E. coli and Klebsiella and this is more high yield. And if it's a slow, you think about Citrobacter and Ceresia. Now, if it's non-lactose fermenting, if it's non-lactose fermenting, then again, we have to do another test. And this is where it gets a little bit confusing because if it's a non-lactose fermenting, then you have to do oxidase positive test once again. If it's oxidase positive over here, oxidase positive, then the organism we think about is Pseudomonas originosa or, or Pseudomonas. Another one is if it's oxidase negative, then there is another complicated thing that happens is we have to see if it's producing hydrogen sulfide on triple sugar iron agar media, TSI agar. If it's hydrogen sulfide is produced over here, then we think about SP. SP is salmonella and proteus. If it's non-hydrogen sulfide producing, then we think about SY. SY is shigella and Yarsinia. And this is the whole breakdown of gram negative organism. Okay. So let me repeat the gram positive gram negative bacilli. First of all, you have a specimen, you do a gram stain. You find that after you do the gram stain, the color has turned pink. So obviously you're dealing with a gram negative. After that, you look at the shape and size. You see that it's a bacilli. Immediately you perform a lactose fermenting test. If it comes back positive, you record the time. If it's a fast one, it's E. coli Klebsiella. If it's slow, it's either Citrobacter or Ceresia. If it's non-lactose fermenting, then you produce, then you do oxidase test. If it's oxidase positive, it's, it's Pseudomonas. If it's oxidase negative, you perform hydrogen sulfide test on TSI agar. If it produces hydrogen sulfide, the organism is Salmonella or Proteus, but it's SP. If it is negative, then it's Shigella and Yarsinia. Yarsinia, okay. Are we clear about this? Yes or no? This whole breakdown? Okay. So can I give you guys the homework of do of perfecting this knowledge at home today? That just as how you perfected the knowledge of gram positive yesterday at home instead of doing it right now? Okay. Okay. Okay, let's begin with Nigeria. Okay. Is everyone ready to begin with Nigeria? Is everyone ready to begin with Nigeria? Okay. Do you guys need a five minute break before you begin with Nigeria? Okay. Let's take that five minute break and then let's come back.
Okay, is everyone back from their break? Can you guys hear my voice? Okay, so let's begin. <clears throat> so let's begin with Nigeria. Okay, so let's begin with Nigeria. First of all, let's begin with this. Nigeria, it's a gram negative virus. I mean, it's a gram negative bacteria. My apologies. Um, just getting everything a bit confused together. I've been taking the lecture for so, so long, my throat kind of hurts. <laughs> okay, okay, so let's begin again. Nigeria, it's a gram-negative bacteria, meaning that it's a gram-negative, it's stained pink. And if it's gram-negative, the next thing we have to see is the shape. If the shape is diplococci, then it's gram-negative. Diplococci, which is highly indicated for Nigeria. They will metabolize glucose and produce IgA protease, that is the IgA produce, producing organisms, so they can cause diseases more in asthenic patients. They contain lipooligosaccharide with strong endotoxin activity. So can they cause more sepsis? Yes or no? Is there a more possibility for sepsis? Can I get some feedbacks from you guys? Is there more possibility for sepsis to happen with Nigeria? Okay. Okay, Niger, it is, uh, Nigeria gonorrhea is often Niger gonorrhea is often intracellular. That is, they remain within neutrophils. As you can see over here, that this is the neutrophil. And they like to colonize inside the neutrophil. As you can see, there are gram-negative diplococci like this. They like to stay together. These are gram-negative diplococci. Now, once again, if there are maltose acid secretion, I mean, the maltose acid um, detection test is positive. Maltose acid detection test is positive. Which one are we talking about? Con gonorrhea or... Mening or, or meningitis. Okay, Nigeria meningitis. Okay, it's a meningococci. Now, the difference between gonococci and meningococci is for gonococci, you do not have any polysaccharide capsule. For meningococci, you have a polysaccharide capsule. Okay, over here, it's M positive, M for maltose, M for meningococci. That's what we said. Okay, there is no vaccine against uh, gonococci because what happens is the vaccine was produced and it doesn't work because the pilus of the bacteria, okay, the, the, bacteri the bacterial pilus over here, they have antigenic variation. That is, they keep on changing their antigens. So you produce an antibody, but it cannot go and work on the antigen because the antigens are changed every time. But vaccines are there against Nigeria meningitis. So that's a type V vaccine, which is available for at-risk individual. It is, it is an STD, gonococca, meaning it's a sexually transmitted disease. This is not a sexually transmitted disease. This is transmitted by respiratory droplets. This causes gonorrhea, septic arthritis, neonatal conjunctivitis, PID, and fudes hook carter syndrome. fudes hook carter syndrome. Do you, remember, do you remember hearing about fitz hook carter syndrome in GI tract? GI, GIT, GIT diseases, yes or no? Who remembers Fitzhugh Carter syndrome in GIT, right? Which organism, I mean, which organ is associated with this syndrome? Liver, very good. Okay, liver. Good, uh, and then this one, obviously the name is meningococci, so they will cause meningococcemia with petechial hemorrhage. The classic presentation is you have patients with fever, headache, and rash fever, headache, and rash. And, 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 and along with this, there is a very high possibility of having ischemia of the adrenal glands. So adrenal insufficiency can happen. This can also happen alongside with fever, DIC, and shock. This is known as waterhouse Friedrichsen syndrome. We studied this in endocrinology. We will not study this in detail. So that, that, that's what happens because there's ischemia and bleeding if, of the adrenal glands. As a result, patients have severe adrenal insufficiency. So that's that. So fever, uh, fever, then fever, headache, rash, adrenal insufficiency, DIC, shock, these are all more common for meningococci. It's diagnosed by nucleic acid amplification test or NAT, and this is diagnosed by culture. Okay. 
the treatment is, is basically very high yield. Okay, treatment is high yield. Treatment is for both uh, gonococci and meningococci, the antibiotic and preference is ceftriaxone, which is, which generation of cephalosporin is ceftriaxone? Second, third, second or third? Okay, so third generation, third generation cephalosporin, or we can use long acting penicillin like penicillin G. And over here, we can give ceftriaxone either with azithromycin or doxycycline. Okay, the fact is because we would like to make sure that since a gonococci is a sexually transmitted disease, while we are prescribing one antibiotic, we do not want the other organism if that can be present to flare up. So we want to make sure that the high yield organism which can happen with gonorrhea is chlamydia. So we want to cover both gonorrhea and chlamydia together. As a result, we would like to prescribe ceftriaxone along with doxycycline for chlamydial coverage, okay? For a, plus, for a possible chlamydial infection. And this is extremely high yield. This is very, very high yield. For gonococci, you, you are not supposed to give ceftriaxone all alone. You are supposed to give ceftriaxone with doxycycline. Are we clear about this? Okay. Are you guys tired? Because I did not hear a lot of responses from you guys. Yes or no, are you guys tired? If you guys are, then I will only read Haemophilus influenza and I'll keep it up to here. Is that something which you guys would want or do you guys, because I wanted to go to page 145. I wanted to go to a page here. Is this something which you guys can do today or do you, do you guys want to do this tomorrow? Okay. Okay, so let's keep on moving. Okay, next one is Haemophilus influenza. Okay, let's, next one is Haemophilus influenza. This is a small gram-negative coccobacillary rod. Okay. For Haemophilus influenza, uh, what I would like to do is, I would like to use a, I would like to use a physio video. The reason being is Haemophilus influenza is actually pretty difficult to remember for all for because there are lots of things which are happening over here and i think a video for hemophilus influenza will actually uh, help you guys out so shall we start with a video for hemophilus influenza yes or no okay we are not doing physio videos for all the organisms because it will take up a lot of time uh, most of you guys have subscriptions to physio so you guys can go and uh, do it at your own time if needed I wouldn't really advise you guys to use physio for all the organisms except the high yield ones. So for the previous gram positive, we used physio for uh, Clostridium uh, botulinum. For this one, we will use the, the video for Haemophilus to make sure that we remember all these signs because Haemophilus influenza is very, very high yield, okay? So uh, who, is, uh, who can take the responsibility of taking a picture for Haemophilus influenza? Okay, Dr. Hassan, okay, thank you. Okay, so there's a lot of information over here. It's a 12 minute video. Are you guys ready? Yes or no? Okay. Should I increase the speed of the video to make sure or you guys see it a little bit faster? Should I increase the speed to 1.5? Welcome to section 20. Because I can increase the speed over here, as you can see. Okay. Let's begin. Four of bacteria. It's like Haemophilus. So it will be our symptoms influenza or H flu. Do we have any students over here who is a big fan of the series, The Office? Did anyone watch The Office? Anyone? Is, is anyone over here a fan of the sitcom, The Office? 
No one? Okay, good. Then you guys are going to enjoy this. Okay. Okay, good. One second. Which you can see right here. This scene will take place inside of an office, as you can see by the desks and the prominent sign that says the office. Office sounds like homophilus, so it will be our symbol for homophilus influenzae. Notice that we've made this office look extra hideous with the very prominent pink walls. This is to remind you that H flu is a gram negative organism. This is a gram stain of H flu. Notice that the organism is red or pink appearing, and in some areas it appears circular or caucus shaped, and in other areas it looks a bit more rod or bacilli shaped. This is why H flu is considered a gram negative coccobacillus. Okay, let's return to the image and introduce a couple characters. Notice that we've shown a girl behind the desk near the top of the image. Her name is Pamela, and she's the receptionist in this office space. The guy towards the front of the image is named James, and he secretly has a crush on Pamela. If you look closely on Pamela's desk, you can see that we've shown several things which are kind of hard to see, so let's zoom up. First, notice that we've shown her cutting some paper with a pair of scissors. Just like in some of our other videos, the scissors are here to help you remember that one of the virulence factors of H flu is an IgA protease. Also notice that we've shown a jar of chocolate, which is here to help you remember that H flu grows on chocolate agar. We covered this in more detail in section 20, which is our Neisseria overview video, but recall that this is an image of chocolate agar. As you can see, it has a distinct brown appearance and looks kind of like chocolate. Chocolate agar is simply heated blood agar, which contains lysed red blood cells. The red blood cells are an important part of the agar because compounds called factor 5 and factor 10 are normally inside of the red blood cells. Therefore, these compounds are only available to the organisms when the medium is heated and the red blood cells are lysed. So remember, H flu can grow on chocolate agar because red blood cells are lysed, which supply the agar with factor 5 and factor 10. Alternatively, H flu can be grown on traditional blood agar next to hemolytic organisms such as Staph aureus because these organisms lyse the red blood cells which provides factors 5 and 10. This is an image of Staph aureus growing on blood agar. The large yellow appearing blobs, for example right here and right here, are colonies of Staph aureus. If you look closely, you can also see little satellite colonies surrounding Staph aureus right here. And these colonies are Haemophilus influenzae. So again, H flu can be grown on blood agar next to hemolyzing organisms because the hemolyzing organisms lyse the red blood cells, which can then supply H flu with factors 5 and 10. Okay, now let's return to the image to help you memorize these details. First, notice that we've shown a staff leaning up against the wall behind Pamela. This is a reference to our Staph aureus video and is to help you remember that H flu can be grown near Staph aureus on blood agar. Next, notice that we've included a starfish on Pamela's desk. The starfish has five points, which should help you remember that factor five is necessary for the growth of H flu. Factor five is also known as nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, or NAD. So starfish with five points for factor five. Finally, notice that we've added a sign on our desk that says 10 rules of the office. Some people in this office space are pretty OCD, so they like to hang up signs about specific rules and regulations. The 10 rules sign is here to help you remember that factor 10 is also required for the growth of H flu. Factor 10 is also known as hematin, so 10 rules sign for factor 10. Okay, let's introduce the OCD person who put this sign up. If we zoom back out, you can see that we've also shown this character named Dwayne that seems pretty upset. He's mad because James put his stapler in some jello, even though Dwayne specifically put a sign up on his desk that says, please respect property. Pretty funny prank if you ask me. Anyway, the please respect property sign should help you remember polyribosylribatyl phosphate or PRP, because the first letters of each word in the phrase, please respect property, makes the abbreviation PRP. Additionally, the stapler is completely surrounded by jello, just like a capsule completely surrounds a bacterium. So think of the jello as a symbol for a capsule. So putting all of this together should help you remember that encapsulated strains of H flu have a polyribosylribatyl phosphate polysaccharide capsule. Okay, before we go any further, let's take a step back to discuss how Haemophilus influenzae is classified, because this can be a bit tricky to grasp. H flu is classified into two categories based upon whether or not the organism produces a capsule, so the presence or absence of a capsule. If the organism does produce a capsule, then it's further classified based upon the antigens within the capsule, and these are called typable strains. So typable strains produce a capsule. If the organism does not produce a capsule, then it's referred to as a non-typable strain. So non-typable strains do not produce a capsule. 
Finally, it's important to know that typeable strains are more invasive. This should make sense to you if you recall that a polysaccharide capsule helps the organism resist phagocytosis. So if the organism cannot be as easily destroyed by the immune system, then it's more likely to infiltrate vital organs and cause more harm. On the other hand, non-typable strains do not produce a capsule, so they're less likely to evade the immune system and are therefore less invasive. Okay, with this in mind, let's return to the image to help you memorize these details. In addition to the please respect property sign, notice that Duane has also neatly placed a strip of tape that divides James's side of the office from Duane's side of the office. As you can tell, he's pretty OCD about his stuff. The tape separating the two sides of the image is here to help you compartmentalize the typable and non-typable strains of H. flu. As we just discussed, typable strains produce a capsule, which is represented in this image by the jello. Therefore, all of the characters and information to the left of the tape on the same side as the jello will represent information about the typable strains. Likewise, everything to the right of the tape where there is no jello will represent information about the non-typable strains. Finally, notice that the tape can no longer be seen right as it goes up next to Pamela's desk right here. So all of the information towards the top of the image that we have already covered is true of both typable and non-typable strains of H. Glue. Okay, notice that Dwayne is pretty pissed off because he's reaching in his drawer for some weapons. He's probably considering retaliating after the stunt that James just pulled off. If you look closely, you can see that Dwayne has a syringe in his drawer. Just like in our other images, the syringe is in this image to help you remember that there is a vaccine for H. flu. More specifically, there is a vaccine for a typable strain of H. flu, which is known as H. flu type B, or HIB. The vaccine contains the type B capsular polysaccharide, or PRP capsule, and is conjugated to a protein. This composition of the vaccine induces T cell dependent memory, which ultimately causes the host to produce antibodies against the PRP capsule. Therefore, the vaccine is only effective against strains of H-flu that produce a capsule. In other words, there is only a vaccine available for the typable strains of H-flu. Fortunately, the typable strains of H-flu are much more dangerous than the non-typable strains of H-flu. So the vaccine is extremely helpful in preventing serious infections. So let's talk about some of the diseases caused by the type B strain of H-flu. First, it causes epiglottitis. Let's pull up a picture of this in case you're unfamiliar with this disease. This is an image of the epiglottis. Notice that it's a cartilaginous structure just behind the tongue right here. It's depressed when you swallow and covers up the top part of the trachea to prevent food from being aspirated. If it becomes inflamed, it can obstruct the airway, resulting in asphyxiation. So it's a medical emergency. To help you remember that H-flu causes epiglottitis, we've shown Duane opening his mouth widely and yelling, Michael! You'll also notice that we've shown an x-ray of epiglottitis on Duane's computer screen. Because this stuff is to the left of the tape, we can assume that we're dealing with the typable strain of H-flu, known as Haemophilus influenzae serotype B, or HIB. So HIB causes epiglottitis. The computer screen looks like the thumb sign, so it's here to help you remember that a thumb sign may be seen on a lateral neck x-ray. This is an image of a lateral x-ray of the neck showing the thumb sign. If you look closely, you can see some resemblance of a thumb. Sometimes you may also see a cherry red epiglottis, which you can see well in this image. This is an endoscopic image of the epiglottis. You can see the cherry red epiglottis right here. Okay, with this in mind, let's return to the image. Remember how Dwayne yelled for his boss, Michael? Well, to Dwayne's dismay, Michael seems to think that James's prank is pretty hilarious, as you can probably tell by the way Michael is laughing and pointing while kneeling on the ground. If you look closely at Michael's knees, you can see that they're very red appearing. The fact that he's on his knees and that the red should help you remember septic arthritis. So Hib causes septic arthritis. Okay, now let's talk about this weird old creepy guy named Credence. He's kind of a shady dude, so it makes sense that he's standing in the corner with his hood on. We've been using hats in our other images as a symbol for meningitis. So Credence's hood in this image should help you remember that Hib causes meningitis. Also notice that Credence is holding a sickle. We've used this in other images to represent sickle cell disease and asplenia. So it's in this image to help you remember that asplenic patients are at an increased risk of developing Hib infections. Remember, the spleen facilitates the removal of encapsulated organisms. So if a patient is asplenic, then encapsulated organisms are more likely to cause disease. So Credence holding up a sickle for asplenia increases the risk of Hib infections. Okay, let's return to Duane's drawer of weapons to see how he plans to retaliate. If you look closely, you can see that there is a trident next to the syringe. Just like in our other videos, the trident is here to help you remember that an effective treatment for Hib is ceftriaxone. So ceftriaxone can be used to treat meningitis, 
septic arthritis, and epiglottitis. In addition to ceftriaxone treatment for meningitis, rifampin should also be given as prophylaxis for close contacts who've been exposed to the individual with meningitis. To help you remember this, we've shown credence wearing a hoodie with a rifle that has a bayonet. We use this symbol in our Neisseria meningitis video, but recall that rifle sounds like rifampin, and the bayonet should make you think of close combat or close contacts. So rifle with bayonet for rifampin prophylaxis for close contacts. Okay, now that we've covered the typable strains of H-flu, let's discuss the non-typable strains. So again, everything to the right side of the tape will represent this. To make this extra memorable, we've shown James's keyboard totally fried with smoke rising above it. In other words, James can no longer type because his keyboard is broken. So you could say that the keyboard is non-typable. I guess in the end, Dwayne got some form of retribution by destroying James's keyboard. Anyway, the broken keyboard should help you remember that everything on the right side of the image is regarding the non-typable strains of H-flu. Because there is no jello on this side of the tape, we can deduce that these strains are not encapsulated. Before we go any further, also notice that smoke is rising from the keyboard as it breaks. We've used clouds of mist or fog in our other images to represent aerosolized transmission, but in this image, it seemed more memorable to show smoke rising from the keyboard. So the smoke rising from the keyboard is here to help you remember that H-flu exhibits aerosolized transmission. You can see that the smoke is crossing over the tape, so this should help you remember that both typable and non-typable strains exhibit aerosolized transmission. Okay, with this in mind, let's discuss diseases caused by the non-typable strains of H-flu. First, notice that there are a bunch of signs on the wall behind James. One of the signs says conference room, and the other says Michael's office. Signs sounds like sinusitis, so all of these signs are here to help you remember that H-flu causes sinusitis. More specifically, non-typable strains of H-flu cause sinusitis, because this is on the right side of the image. Okay, now let's zoom up on James so we can see a few more important details. First, notice that James is wearing headphones. Just like in our other videos, this is here to help you remember that H-flu causes acute otitis media. More specifically, non-typable strains of H-flu cause acute otitis media. This is an otoscopic image of otitis media. Notice that the tympanic membrane is bulging out towards the viewer and appears red. This is a classic physical exam finding of otitis media. Second, notice that James's eyes are super red, probably because he's been playing Call of Duty on his computer screen for the past 12 hours straight. Anyway, his red eyes are here to help you remember that non-typable strains of H-flu cause conjunctivitis. Finally, as I just mentioned, James has been playing a lot of the video game Call of Duty, as you can see on his computer screen. If you look closely at the two characters on his screen, you can see that one is holding up an ammo belt, which is our symbol for amoxicillin, and the other is holding up a cleaver, which is our symbol for clavulanate. This is here to help you remember that non-typable strains of H-flu can be treated with amoxicillin and clavulane. Okay. So, um, Welcome to section 24. Okay, so Dr. Hassan, were you able to take a picture? Dr. Hassan, were you able to take a picture? No? Okay. One second. Okay, how about now? Can you take a picture right now, please? Okay. <clears throat> okay, so uh, did you guys realize how many informations there are about hemophilus influenzae? Yes or no? Is there a lot of information or not? Okay, okay. So let's read about hemophilus influenzae. Firstly, it does not have a lot of information. Most of it is there in the physio video. So uh, please don't forget the picture mnemonic over there. Hemophilus influenzae, as we, saw, as we just saw, it's a small gram-negative coccobacilli. It has an aerosol transmission and there are two forms. There's non-typable and typable. Non-typable strains are the most common cause of mucosal infections, that is otitis, conjunctivitis, and bronchitis as well as invasive infections such as the vaccine for capsular type B. They are IgA producing, they are IgA protease pro producing organisms, right? Along with Streptococcus pneumoniae in Nigeria. They are cultured on chocolate agar and they grow on chocolate agar because for the presence of factor five and factor 10. Factor five is NAD, 10 is hemantin, for which they can be, uh, for which they can grow. They can also grow with Staph aureus, 
which produces, which provides the factor V because staph aureus is that beta hemolytic. When it breaks down RBC, it releases the factor V. So hemophilus can grow alone in the chocolate media or they can grow in a blood agar media with staph aureus. Hemophilus, EMOP, you can use it to remember epiglottitis, meningitis, otitis, and pneumonia. This can cause cherry red, um, this can be cherry red and cherry red, and this can show as a thumb sign on lateral neck x-ray. As you can see, this has a thumb sign for the epiglottitis, okay? Thumb sign for the epiglottitis, okay. Um, uh, another one is the vaccine that it produces, it contains type B capsular polysaccharide for the vaccine against polyribosome, ribotyl phosphate, poly, polyribosome, ribotyl phosphate. It is, con it is conjugated with um, diphtheria toxin or other protein so that it has a better immune response and it's given between two and 18 months of age. The treatments are basically amoxicillin and clavulonic acid and we can give ceftriaxone and rifampin for close contact. This is high yield. This you will get a lot of questions from this, especially from NBME. That is what type, which, which uh, pharmacological agent can be prescribed for prophylaxis against hemophilus uh, meningitis and the answer is rifampin, okay? And for treatment, you can give amoxicillin and clavulonic acid. Are we all clear about this, yes or no? Are we clear about this, hemophilus? What is your question? What is your question? Difference between typable and non-typable is capsule, yes. Poly, ribosol, ribitol, pyrophosphate, capsule, okay? Okay, now, the last uh, bacteria that we want to discuss for today before we, before we stop over here, because I feel like we should start from over here from tomorrow because there are a lot of um, high yield informations which there, which has to be taken into consideration when we study Legionella and Pseudomonas. So is it a good idea to keep it up to here? Yes or no? Okay. Is everyone ready for Acinetobacter bomini? Okay, Acinetobacter bomini is a gram-negative, strictly Arabic oxidase-negative coccobacillus. How common is Acinetobacter infection? How common is it? Everyone, how common is having an Acinetobacter infection? Can I get some feedbacks from you guys, yes or no? Okay, they are not common. And you guys are right. If they're not common, is there a high possibility for you to be tested on this? If it's not that common, is there a high possibility for you to be tested on this? Okay. But there is one condition where you can get a question and it's there in your friendly question bank embossed, okay? That is, you have two questions over there that they tell you that you have a patient, okay? You have a patient who has been in the ICU for a long period of time on mechanical ventilation, okay? And now all of a sudden, the patient has consolidations in the lungs along with hypotension and uh, tachycardia. So what they're talking about is sepsis due to ventilator-associated pneumonia. One of the most high-yield gram-negative organism for causing ventilator-associated pneumonia is Acinetobacter. So that is something which you can have to remember. If you have a gram-negative coccobacillus, which is associated with ventilator or mechanical ventilator-associated pneumonia, then the one high yield gram negative organism is a cyanotobacter. Are we clear about this? Yes or no? That is the only question. Okay. 
Are we clear? So can we keep the lecture up to here? Yes, it's, it's, it's not there in 2019. It's not there in 2019, you're right. Okay. So tomorrow we can finish bacteriology as a whole. Okay. Okay. So tomorrow we can finish bacteriology and then it will take us one day to finish fungus, uh, two days to finish parasites. I'm not sure how uh, well we can finish it in one week, but I'll, well, I, I will still try my best, okay? I'll still try my best to finish it in one week, but um, tomorrow we can finish bacteriology for 100%, okay? Okay, so uh, having said that, do you guys realize the homeworks which you guys have for today? Yes or no? The homeworks? Okay. So, if you guys have to do uh, go and do and uh, go and do the homework, can can we end the lecture over here for today? Yes or no? Okay. Okay. So let's end the lecture over here today, so that you guys can take some break and start revising the microbiology you you read. And in the meantime, if possible, if you guys do get the time, please do ten questions from biostatistics because don't forget that. Don't forget that we did we just did biostatistics last week so we want to make sure that you guys don't forget biostatistics okay so thank you so much for doing the lecture for today hope you guys had a great lecture if you guys have any questions please send us an email does anyone have any questions regarding the exam or, the, or our lecture right now if because if you guys do then now is the best time for me to ask for you to ask me does anyone have any questions <laughs> Does anyone have any question? Okay, so if no one has any question, thank you so much for doing the lecture for uh, today. And I uh, hope you guys do the homework properly. And uh, Dr. Dali and Dr. Hassan, please don't forget to do the equation challenge for 15 minutes, read the equations for the last page of the first aid, and then complete the challenge by trying to write it down in 10 to 15 minutes. Okay, so um, that's that. Thank you so much. I'll see you guys tomorrow at 9 a.m. If you guys have any questions, send us an email. If you guys like our lecture, give us a feedback on Facebook, or if we would highly appreciate if you can give us a feedback on us on a discussion group of USMLE Step 1 so that people who are struggling with USMLE Step 1 can uh, help find can find us and um, we can help them out do well. Okay, so thank you so much. Hope you guys have a great day. I'll see you guys tomorrow at 9 a.m. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye now.